Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, June 9th, 2022. I'm Liz Exton, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. There are not many friends here tonight. Mr. Hainer? I'm present. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Here. We're going to move his... All right, I have not heard oh, from Mr. Schlickman or chair. Oh. Ms. Allison Ampey, oh. Dr. Allison Ampey, but okay, I'm going to keep going. We have a quorum. <laughs> Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. On February 15th, 2022, Governor Baker signed into law a new session law extending certain COVID-19 related measures. The new law, Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, includes an extension until July 15th, 2022, of the remote meeting provisions of the governor's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight may be taken by roll call if we have a remote person. Okay, our first item on the agenda is public participation. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 20 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed three minutes each. Dr. Allison Ampey will be the timer and will give the speaker a signal when they have 30 seconds left. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 20 minutes, the number of speakers may be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy BEDH that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of the Arlington Public Schools. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. Um, we have two people signed up for public comment this evening. Uh, one was going to be in person and I, oh, I do see them. <laughs> Julie Hall, Miss Hall. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I know how busy everybody is this time of year. Um, so I've emailed you all this week and I'm here to advocate for overnight um, science camp. Um, I understand that Alton Jones is closed and we're having an opportunity to build upon and improve our science camp for Arlington Public Schools. Three of my four children have attended science camp and have had excellent experiences. This was their first trip away from home. I admit I was nervous, they were nervous, but I think that in the end, we all were better for it. Um, they also gained confidence from the experience, so it's difficult to put into words each of their own experiences, but I do believe there's a social and emotional connection made in this less formal setting um, that's really unique to science camp. Um, I remember them learning how to take care of themselves for three days. Um, they had chores they had to do, they had a schedule of getting up, putting their clothes away, and they were disciplined there. And I really believe that this builds confidence and is really important now in this time um, after the pandemic. Um, I asked my son tonight, 
you know, if he can remember just the small little things that he liked about science camp. I think there's a lot of parents listening tonight that don't really understand what it is. And many in K through five might not have children that have been. Um, but he recalls a night hike and he said only the leader had the flashlight, but that's something that we've, we never do as a family. So that for him was unique and I'm sure it was for a lot of the kids. And um, another experience was he remembers catching minnows in a pond and fish and how some children caught frogs. Another unique experience that I understand it might not be tied exactly to the curriculum, but again, another experience that you can't replicate in the classroom um, that I think is important. I also remember him talking about the camp counselors, and I think they're all passionate. That's why they're there. And I think they, the children learn to respect nature and they develop an interest, interest in the ecosystem. And I do recall in fifth grade, they built a terrarium that had different layers with a big Pepsi bottle. And on the one part was, was, um, was the earth. They had worms in there. They had something growing on top. So there, there was something built around the ecosystem when one of my children was in the fifth grade. Um, and I recognize that some of the grammar schools had different challenges. Um, and, and, and I think we need to talk about them. So I'm craving to hear healthy discussions about how we got here and, and really where we're going. Um, I'm disappointed that I even have to sit here and do this tonight. Um, I was hoping our school administration would be doing this for us and all of you in this room. Um, I feel like this process has lacked transparency. I didn't even understand that we were in this position until I was listening to one of these Monday CIAA meetings that was revolved around heterogeneous classes. You have about 30 seconds. Okay. So, I think COVID created the perfect storm for Alton Jones to close and our program to terminate because of undisclosed issues, but that doesn't have to be our ending. Now is the time to make overnight science camp the best experience for all students, built with transparency that starts today. And I look forward to hearing Dr. Holman's overview and moving forward. My other side comment is, is it possible for to consider this process, to reconsider it, it just feels strange that I'm speaking to you about something really important, but I'll never get a response. It's like being in a vacuum. And it just feels odd. And I just think maybe we can think about a different way to do this that actually builds real-time discussions with possible comments at the end after we learn things. And maybe it would create less emails. Thank you. Thank you. Our next public speaker this evening is Elizabeth Pyle. Ms. Pyle. Hi. My name is... and emotional 
emotional development, for gaining independence, for that joy of learning and discovery that only a, a field trip can bring. Um, I also uh, would recommend the Nature's Classroom facility. I went there on a retreat with my synagogue this spring. It was lovely. It, it was clean. The food was good. Um, the bunks were in great repair. They had rooms with individual bathrooms, uh, like two or four to, uh, I think it was four bunks to a room with their own bathroom in like a long house. Um, they had different kinds of facilities for different kinds of groups that we didn't even stay in. They had big meeting spaces. Was it a lovely campus in the woods? They have staff that's geared toward this type of thing. But even if they're not the right choice, there are some other choices. I'd be interested in hearing what other communities that used Alton Jones have moved on to now. Um, I know Miss Pyle, you have about 30 seconds. There's a place called Gormdale in Plymouth that I um, was, that was recommended to me that I put in my email. So I would just really urge you to consider this experience as an overnight experience for fifth graders. I don't know whether it's curriculum or field trip, but making learning fun and the social and educational components of this are paramount for me, and I just urge you to consider it. Thanks, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Homan's going to make a statement about Science Camp right now, and then uh, the committee will discuss it, can discuss it um, during the superintendent update, but just in the interest of these listeners not having to listen for three hours. <laughs> yeah, so I was going to address this as part of the superintendent's update, but um, since you both are here, and I know that folks might be watching to hear more about where we're at um, and what has gone on with Science Camp, I'll go ahead and speak now. Uh, so. I just want to note that it's, there hasn't been a non-transparent process and that there hasn't really been much of a process. We knew that we needed to come up with an alternative to what the science camp experience had been when we came back to school this year, and we were doing so in the midst of a lot of uncertainty about what might be possible given the status of the pandemic. Early this fall, we asked our science director to think about what some alternative experiences might be, and she, along with a couple of teachers, started thinking about an immersive interdisciplinary project-based, um, really tied, closely tied to the curriculum and the standards experience that students could do in the context of the school day. This is something that they started to plan, and then the Omicron um, surge hit, and I know that what I'm about to say might sound like an excuse, and it certainly is not intended that way, but the reality of it is that our science director was teaching um, in a sixth grade classroom for a couple of months, and she needed to be the person who guided the planning for this experience. And so we um, had to table the planning for that, which is going to take some considerable time. And we think that something like that is something we should do. We do want to plan for that anyway. It would bring students from fifth grade across the district together to do something very um, exciting and experiential in the science curriculum. But what I also want to acknowledge is that I don't think that that actually hits all the points that families are advocating for when they talk to us about Science Camp, because what we hear is that the overnight experience is what's really special, that that um, going away with your classmates is really special, that that launch into sixth grade and being together as all Arlington students is part of what makes it special, that the social emotional components are what makes it special. So we're hearing that and we want to make sure that we don't lose some of those things that we're hearing from community members are part of why we're advocating for the, an experience like this to be part of what our students have in Arlington. Um, and so we're not, we are not able to do what we had originally planned to do this year because we lost the planning time. Uh, we are planning to plan for that experience next school year and are anticipating that we will not encounter some of the same challenges and barriers that um, just sidelined it this year. And we are open to a conversation and a process and a discussion and a dialogue about what it would look like to ensure that we do something more like the science camp experience in future years, knowing that we've lost the venue that we used to use. But I do want to name a few things that will need to be part of that dialogue. One is accessibility. And when we talk about accessibility for an experience like this, we're not just talking about financial accessibility. We are also talking about accessibility for all students to access the programming, making sure that the services and supports are in place for students who might need additional accommodations in order to be able to experience this in a way that is supportive for them and is fun 
for all of our kids, regardless of what their needs are, regardless of what their demographics are, regardless of whether they are an Arlington resident student or a Boston resident student. So that's one big thing that we'll need to tackle. Another one is logistics. The coordination of an experience like this is a pretty major task and undertaking. And for that to fall sort of in a dispersed way on lots of different people can create a logistical challenge for the schools. Um, and that can create a liability, which we don't want to do. We want to make sure that we're doing something that is safe and that is well supported and that is well staffed. Staffing is another logistical challenge that this has faced. And so we'll need to make sure that we have a plan to ensure that it is staffed appropriately um, and that gets back to that accessibility consideration and that we are able to incentivize the staffing of this so that teachers want to participate and want to be engaged in it and want to be part of the work. Uh, because having students together in a group setting like that does require us to have educators available for it. Um, and then I also want us to talk in whatever dialogues take place next about purpose. What is the goal of this? Is it about bringing our students together? Is it about, um, is it about extending the science, the work we do in our science curriculum? Or is it about extending the work we also do in our SEL curriculum? Uh, is it about bringing our kids together as they launch into sixth grade? Something that's really special about the sixth grade school is that they all come together as one group of Arlington students. I've heard the sixth graders talk about how awesome that is about their Gibbs experience. And are there things that we can consider and do that will help ease some of these other challenges that I mentioned because we do have the school-based model that we have now. So I think we have possibilities. Um, we are not shutting down the conversation. We are not able to do something this year, but that does not mean that we will not in the future and we are looking forward to getting some of this dialogue started next year. Thank you, Dr. Homan. And committee members, when we get to the um, superintendent's report, Dr. Homan can mention it again and we can have a, a committee conversation. All right. Um, next on our agenda is an AEF update. I'm very happy to welcome Judy Geyer, the president of the Arlington Education Foundation, uh, to our meeting this evening to give us an update on grants from this year. Welcome, Judy. Ms. Geyer, sorry. <laughs> Nope, she's actually um, Judy. Are you able to share your screen? You should be able to as a panelist. That might be easier on your end for you to do it. Yep. Opportunities and we make funding decisions. 
Every year we set funding priorities. They're loose. Um, but we typically spend about 30% of our funding on district improvement grants. That's the blue slice of the pie. That grant is, uh, is usually going to be the superintendent. Uh, and the aim of that one is to um, support and enhance education across the district. So we want to get a district level. We also fund grants that we call development and expansion grants. These tend to be on the order of ten to twenty thousand dollars. A curriculum head, a department chair, or Dr. McNeil might approach us about expanding on the current program so that it reaches more classrooms or more schools, or maybe it's PD opportunity for a group of teachers to coordinate curricula across schools. A lot of our funding is also available for individual teachers, both through innovation grants and through scholar awards. Um, I'm going to give examples of these in the next few slides. So this year, our big district investment grant was to support the five-year district vision and strategic planning. Uh, so ADF provided the funding for the third-party facilitator who led the collaborative stakeholder planning process. The AEF grant also provided support for community participation and logistical support. And you can see at the bottom of the slide some um, district investment grants we have funded in the past. So um, that, was our, that was our big um, grant this year. We funded several development and expansion grants this year. We saw a lot of interest from teachers um, work in our major spaces in the secondary schools. So um, on to high, got an additional kiln, vacuum table, electric furnace, tool cart, and a few other things to add to their major space area. Audison got uh, home more laser printers and 3D printers and also some new robotics equipment. Uh, what we're really excited about for the development and expansion grants um, at the secondary levels is that we've also funded some professional development activities. So the tech teachers at Gibbs, Audison, and Arlington High together are going to discuss 3D printing the curriculum and its integration across grades 6 through 12. Um, that PD opportunity is um, going to be uh, held at the MIT's Edgerton Center for Technology Teachers. The other development and expansion grant we're really excited about is for a great level that AEF sometimes has trouble reaching, and that's our youngest learners, um, kindergarten through seventh grade. The district's uh, digital learning leader, Ms. Prickhar, approached AEF for a funding request for uh, robots and uh, a curriculum to teach early programming skills to kindergarten through seventh graders at all of our seven elementary schools. So uh, the implementation is, is just beginning, um, but by using programmable robots, um, students will not only learn early programming skills, but also use the robot as a tool uh, that can aid in their uh, development to interpret sequences which show up all over the place in this age group, right? The life cycle of a frog, or the narrative of a poem, or um, the distance of the planets from the sun. So we're really excited for this, this new curriculum for K-2. Uh, next, we have our innovation grants. Um, again, these are grants that are requested by teachers, individual teachers. Uh, the maximum is $4,000. We uh, funded four innovation grant activities at the elementary school level. Uh, the ADF asked us to um, foster innovation and curiosity through, these, through this grant mechanism. And we want to help teachers be, be curious and find a way to implement new ideas in the classroom with the interest of testing whether or not it's a success and a potential activity that should be integrated in the classroom in the long run. So 
So um, at Stratton, uh, one of the reading specialists is using a uh, new version of specialized text for our early readers in the later grades, where it's always a challenge to find content-rich material. Um, the art teacher at Dallin is um, working with a visiting artist to, for the first time, introduce wire sculpture art into the curriculum. There are a few other examples here um, that we were excited to fund at the elementary level. We funded six innovation grants at the secondary level, and they're all listed here. I do want to point out that a lot of the requests for funding from teachers this year, and honestly in the last two years, have come from non-core curriculum teachers. So uh, art, music, um, phys ed, and we want to make sure in the next year that we are reaching the core curriculum teachers as well. Um, we know that there's been a lot of uh, struggle just to deliver basic content as we all adjust in the pandemic and in this, these new years of, of everyone being back in school. Um, so there might be little room left over for innovation and curiosity outside the delivery of the main curriculum, but we want to be there for teachers. Um, and so next year, one of our goals is really to do more outreach about our grant opportunities and also to make sure that we're very transparent about uh, the grants that, that we fund. Okay, I want to land here on this thank you slide just because I want to emphasize that it's with the collaboration of the school committee and Dr. Coleman and Ms. Dunn that we really get an opportunity to put our donors' funds to work. We are just a facilitator um, trying to help uh, those in the community that want to invest extra in the schools actually reach the schools. And so we are completely dependent on uh, working with, with you and, and school staff to make sure that that happens. So thank you. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Skyer. Um, does anyone have any questions mm -hmm. or comments? Mr. Cardin. Thank you. I just want to thank uh, Ms. Geyer and all of AEF for welcoming me and uh, letting, me, letting me help them help the school system the last five years. It's a great organization, mm -hmm. um, very strong, um, lots of individuals who are very motivated and do a lot of work to do the fundraising and the grant review and, mm -hmm. and all of that necessary to, um, to, in, to help input a lot of funds into the district in a, in a lot of innovative ways. So it's a, great organization and I thank them for their all their work and wish you good luck in your participation with them. Thanks. Thanks. Anybody else? Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, I want to thank you too. Uh, and you mentioned the fact that a lot of the grants go to uh, teachers of specials and not uh, core classroom teachers, which isn't a bad thing because the core, the, the special teachers see uh, the entire school and have a lot more needs for stuff in order to do their uh, to do their work with. So, when I was working in Lowell, the, the teachers who were always at a disadvantage in terms of any kind of uh, supply uh, formula for for getting equipment and stuff tended to have the most problems. So, uh, I, I wouldn't be too concerned if we're putting money into into specials because it it, it goes a long way in, in, in that case. But uh, just, just keep on doing what you're doing. It's a wonderful thing, and I'm, I'm glad it's going well, and, and I hope that uh, uh, it, it gets bigger and better as we go along. Thanks. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank both you, your volunteers who have been working on this so much, and also the donors who have been funding this mm -hmm. program for decades, I believe. Um, in its various forms over the years. And it's without the donors, we wouldn't be able to, our teachers wouldn't be able to try these experiments that they want to try or, you know, innovations in education. We wouldn't be able to do the big expansion grants or, or the district-wide programs. And um, I think, you know, our community deserves a big round of thanks too mm -hmm. for making this possible. But but you folks too for making, for. Mm -hmm 
facilitating. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Anybody else? Dr. Homan. So I want to echo the thanks of the committee and just say um, I have gotten such a warm welcome and such excellent partnership from AEF this year. And I'm really excited about the district improvement work that we are doing. Um, it has been a wonderful spring and there's a lot of really positive energy because of the support that we got from AEF and some of the early um, imagining and partnership work that you also introduced me to many community members who are able to help us uh, with the work that we want to do in the schools and bring a lot of really valuable expertise to it. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed running in the 5K too, by the way. Um, and that was an awesome event. So I look forward to that happening in the future too. Anybody? Okay. Um, I'll just echo the thanks briefly um, for all of the work that AEF has done. And I am looking forward to um, being the school committee representative uh, going forward. So thank you so much for coming, Ms. Skyer. I appreciate it. Thank you all. All right, our next um, agenda item is a METCO update from Ms. Smith. All right, thank you. Michelle, if you wanna tell me when to move, I will move the slides. Okay, you got it. Mm -hmm. Let me take this off, it's so annoying. <laughs> by the end of the day. All right, thank you for having me, school committee, Dr. Holman, faculty here, and uh, those listening. Uh, I am the MECL director. My name is Rochelle Smith. We can move forward and <laughs> talk about the program. Uh, so, so excited to be back in Arlington, my third year here, so uh, excited and first year in this position. And so um, the program structure, I'm gonna talk about also the, the vision and the mission. The core mission really was to build relationships. As someone coming in new um, into uh, this position, it was definitely to build relationships and also to build and interconnect those relationships with the students, the families, the MECO program overall, Arlington staff, and the Arlington and Boston community while increasing program engagement, and that is with students, families, and faculty, uh, student academic and SEL achievement, social and emotional achievement. So currently we have three full-time staff members. That's the director. We have a licensed social worker that primarily works with our elementary students. Her office is stationed at Audison Middle School. So sometimes she does interface with our um, middle school students. Um, we have a TA bus monitor. We have two part-time staff members, a TA and our parent liaison. And then we have, as you got to know, um, for AEF board member, which is new this year, we have a MECO parent um, that's a part of that. We have 70 students in the program. There's 31 elementary students, 19 middle school students, 20 high school students. Um, and we are in Bishop, Hardy, Pierce, Gibbs, Audison, in the high school. And right now we currently operate three school buses um, through Easton Bus. Arlington Transportation, and we have one late bus for our high school students. Can click. You're good. Um, so employee highlights. Uh, I serve as a co-advisor for the Black Student Union here at the high school. Um, I participated in district-based learning walks, instructional rounds, SEL uh, data planning, 51A working group, equity response meetings. Uh, myself and the social worker in the program, we lead a monthly BIPOC affinity group for BIPOC students, that is black indigenous people of color, uh, students who identify as such, and we lead that at Audison Middle School. We do that once a month during their lunch time. We split it up because they have three lunches, so we have three groups during that time. Um, our parent liaison uh, participated, um, invited by Ms. Thomas, has a, participated in the Mass Partnership for Diversity in Education. And some of the affiliations listed here is uh, MECO Headquarters. We have a very close relationship with MECO Headquarters. Simmons University, that's through the African American Alumni Association, as well as the DEI Subcommittee for the Alumni Network. Uh, we do have a veteran, a U.S. Army we are connected with, Ruth Way for Women, which is a nonprofit that serves homeless women, uh, Boston Public Health Commission, Mass Bay Community College, and the Boston Police Department. Looking to expand to the Boston Police Department, too. Uh, so our 2021-22 20, 20, student highlights, uh, we have four graduated seniors all going to college in the fall, Albany State University, Bunker Hill, Framingham State University, UMass Dartmouth, 
Uh, three of those students received the NAACP Mystic Valley Branch MLK uh, scholarship, and two of the students are, of those graduated students received the J. J. U. A. Jo Jones Memorial Scholarship from the St. Paul Evangelical Lutheran Church in Arlington. Uh, seven students participated in our MECO director, seven high school students participated in our MDA youth conference. So there was two that were hosted this year and the students really enjoyed that. Uh, and three of our middle school students participated in Audison's anniversary. They had community interviews. And those were, um, filmed uh, via YouTube as well, but three of them participated, and it's funny, three of the folks that they interviewed, I know, so personally, so it was great. Didn't even know that. Didn't even know one of them was a MECO student. Um, and so our high school students participated in in-school-based programs, the BSU, volleyball, basketball, football, ski club. Uh, middle school students participated in school-based music, band, chorus, softball, affinity groups, in organizing what is coming up June 14th, Rep Your Flag Day. And our elementary students participated in uh, school-based PTO events and after-school activities. Some of the pictures here. Uh, this is from one of our youth, MDA youth conferences, and this is some of the students that attended, and they asked me, why did you pick us? They're, they're the quiet bunch, so that's why I picked you. You shine from within, I do see your leadership, and so there it is, there they are. They had a <coughs> wonderful time. Parents did report that, <laughs> go to the next one. This is from graduation. Um, I literally ran out to the field so that I can catch all four of them before they you know, made their way to the festivities after, uh, and so these are our uh, graduating uh, our graduated seniors right here. Really proud of them. All right, let me move on. So new program implementations and some of the connections that we've made with the Arlington community as well. Uh, so again, I'll highlight that we have our parent representative for the AEF board. Uh, we also started um, Friends of Arlington MECO Advisory, which is not a nonprofit yet. We would like for it to be. So it is a for-profit right now. Um, and we had our first donation from the NAACP Mystic Valley branch. We also partnered with ACE, uh, Arlington Community Ed, for a three-week summer program with transportation for our MECO students to come out here and really, again, start building those relationships with the community. So we have 18 students that will start in week two, 18 students for week three, and 16 students for week four. And we have solidified that Arlington Eats will provide lunch for our students as well. So that's another partnership. Uh, in 20. 22 and 23, uh, we are drafting a internship for one of our students, so that will either be an 11th grade student or a 12th grade student who will be able to have a uh, internship opportunity with the NAACP Mystic Valley. Um, so some of the little connections that we had, we had the Boston Public Health Commission provide our graduating seniors with swag bags. We had um, Kurt Faustin from the Dropout Academy come in and facilitate a young men's wellness workshop at Audison Middle School. And after those students were done, they were like, Miss Smith, uh, the girls really need it the most, so excuse. <laughs> so hopefully we can get him to come back for the, for the, for the young ladies. Um, we also had State Representative China Tyler that offered community service hours to some of our Arlington Mecco High School students in the past. Some of our students have participated in that. Um, and then we had the Boston Public Health Commission that offered community service and employment opportunities to our seniors. Arlington Transportation offered, also offered employment opportunities for our seniors to come back and maybe bus monitor for the summertime for some of the program that things that's going on. So we're looking to maybe solidify one of those things. Uh, Arlington Eats also offered volunteer opportunities for our students. As, and AYCC provided our families that were in crisis with gift cards that were very helpful during those times of crisis. So those were some of the partnerships and connections that the program has made. Spreading the news about um, Arlington Mecco, I was able to do some presentations this school year. So I went to Pierce, Bishop, Audison, and Hardy. Um, 
was hoping to expand to other areas, but it was hard because I would impede upon their teacher time. So I uh, was lucky to get these times. I also did some presentations to the PTOs as well with Hardy and also Bishop PTOs. We had a couple events where we've had 10 family meetings this year. We've also had a family art night that we hosted in Boston at the MECO headquarters. We did a bridge in two communities annual family walk where our wonderful superintendent was a part of that. It was so much fun. Uh, we did moving, we're doing moving on school-based celebrations. Those are coming up next week uh, for each school. And we have weekly lunch bunches that our social worker hosts. And we have been inviting our resident friends and it has been a hoot. <laughs> Ask Mark from Bishop. <laughs> so the, this is a picture of Family Art Night. We're looking to do a banner. So we started with Mecco, uh, and we, we have Arlington as well. So um, that is uh, some of that work that we did. And then you can move. And this is from our Family's Walk, which is an annual walk, by the way. So this is the second one. So we plan on doing this every year. So that was some of our participants. All right. And... Recently, we did Audison Day, and Mecco was an intricate, Arlington Mecco was an intricate part of that, and that was a day dedicated to inclusion and belonging, and five of our Arlington Mecco students participated in the student panel discussion, including one high school student, and then one student was selected to be an artist for the keynote speaker. Uh, I served as, I, I facilitated, put together the student panel discussion, but I served as a moderator for one of those panel discussions. We split it up. So we had three panel discussions going on at the same time. Uh, students were really nervous. 300 um, of my peers I have to talk in front of, but they got through it, so it was good. Um, and then I facilitated an interactive discussion and presentation with the history of the MECO program and where it is now. And during that, it, I wanted it interactive, so I had the students work in groups to come up with a MECO slogan. And one of the slogans that the students came up with was learning together, working together for better education. This also was highlighted in uh, MECO headquarters, Millie's Monday message, and we were recognized for some of the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work that we're doing in the district. So that was really nice for that to happen. And those pictures, that's the um, high school, that's the bus that they came on too in the back. So that's the high school students, uh, the panels, and they were mixed in with the middle school students. And that is some of our um, panelists that is um, from, yeah, that's from my panel discussion. So that's some of the MECO students as well in that. And looking ahead, that's another picture from Audison Day. Um, looking ahead, we are super excited and students are excited for Ride the Bus with Superintendent Day. So we're super excited for that. Um, <laughs> I, it's very often, it's not very often that students get to ride with the superintendent. So this is exciting. Um, we're looking to expand into Dallin. We also are looking to incorporate academic instructional support specialists for our elementary and middle school students. Continuing summer fun so in the programming, so we're offering a additional weeks, not just three weeks, but additional weeks to families. Uh, looking into requiring all our new uh, kindergarten families coming in to participate in a week summer reading and math program uh, just to stay afloat and try to stay on curriculum. And we also are looking to um, implement host families. So I know that's something that was that's happened in the past and so we want to bring that back and we want to make sure that it's done organically. So really incorporating the teachers in that. Um, and so that is another program that we are looking to looking ahead to do. And this is our cool middle schoolers just hanging out. So I thought that would be a nice little <laughs> segue into any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Hainer. The only comment I got to say is you exhaust me. <laughs> You're phenomenal. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you. Mr. Slickman. Yeah, uh, with regard to the host families, when I was teaching in Boston, my principal was an Arlington Metco parent, and she developed such a close relationship with her host family that it was really a, a very positive thing, and it was just an underlying structure for the families that, that was really, really beneficial for, for both parties. And on these oddball days where kids need to go home and come back, it gave them a, 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 an Arlington home to go home to uh, 
rather than having to schlep back and forth to Boston, because I know I've made that commute the other direction. So it's not easy. Um, I, I want to point out that you, you have helped us in the school committee putting together the school committee chat, because we've had a couple of dedicated sessions for MECO parents, and I was very impressed how everybody really feels connected to each other, and there's just that support network among the parents who are involved in the program, and I know that a lot of that ability to support each other is coming from your effort and Margaret's efforts to build that community, so that's really a job well done. And anything we can do to help further support the MECO program, I think that uh, everybody here is firmly committed to it and would, would like to see it flourish. Absolutely, thank you so much. Ms. Morgan. Um, I, I had a question for you and then maybe also from Dr. Hooman. Um, you know, she has a lot of um, latitude in terms of admitting students, right? Because she's sort of singularly charged with that. Um, and I was curious how that process is going for next year as, you know, our, how are we doing at bringing students in and getting them where they need to go? It, it, you know, there were definitely some years there where it was really, really hard because we were, you know, we just had, we had so many, so many students. Um, so I guess I'm curious how that experience has been for, for you and, and what, if anything, could be improved around that. Absolutely. So I will say I'm thankful that I had two years to be able to be a part of uh, the new uh, family orientations and interviews. So right now we have six families that will be entering. So we, we, we lost we, we lost six, which is the four graduating students. Then we had two that um, one graduated and then one left the program. So we do have six that are replacing those ones that we do lost and about four of them right now. No, five have already registered. So they're already registered. We've already had meetings with them. They've come in. Uh, they are connected to their principal now because of them registering so early on. We do have two more students in our queue um, that will be going through the same meet and greet sessions, come check out the uh, school, and then we connect with them just to make sure and we'll do our placement based upon seat availability. So it actually is going very well. I like the process, it's kind of streamlined, and I've been constant communication with Dr. Holman about what that looks like and where our students can be placed. Um, our families are super excited, and one of our families was really, really adamant about having a host family. Um, and so he, he is a father. He's not a Mecco, but he had family member that was Mecco and they talked about their experience as host having host families so our families we are educating them on what the program looks like in Arlington because they're not all the same um, I'm a Newton um, graduate so I'm a Newton Mecco graduate so these programs don't look the same across the districts and so we tell them about the school we tell them about the principal and we have really been getting great engagement from our new families so I am super excited about our new families I tell that to the principals that will have them I'm like you are gonna love this one you're gonna love that one and they're already <laughs> they've already been invited to some of those end of the school um, uh, programmings that some of the schools are having so the it has been a very like smooth process and I will say because I did have that background with working with Miss Thomas uh, with the MECO program so it's been it's been pretty easy and MECO headquarters also helps you in that process as well. So anytime you have concerns, questions about the process and how it's looking, they're, they're like readily available to help out. So mm -hmm. haven't had any difficulties. I'm actually in the, re like I'm really excited. <laughs> and do we use, I mean, are we, do we normally do like six out, six in? Like, I mean, cause we're not obviously replacing them with who's, like I'm, I'm right. just curious what the rest, like, I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense, but yeah. I'm, so to expand, to expand rapidly has some pretty big implications in terms of the DESI grant that we get from the state. And so we can't expand. It, it, we, we don't want to have too big of a jump from one year to another in terms of enrollments in and out. However, um, you can, like, it can be one or two students here and there. And then the DESI has also told us, like, if you want to do, have any level of significant expansion, we just need to know because of how they're starting to structure grants. They're actually looking into restructuring of grants for next year and restructuring of enrollment 
process um, to allow families to have a little bit more, and districts actually, to have a little bit more choice and ability to open applications um, prior to the act, like it, the way it operates now, you can probably speak more um, yeah. eloquently to this, is the pretty blind process. Yep. So they're working on opening that up a little more to give both the families more choice and the school districts more visibility. Did I say yes. that right? Yes, yes. So school districts more visibility. There's even tours they're talking about doing. So like taking them to different districts so they can see. And then families being able to have some sort of choice in the process. Like she said, it's really blind. So um, once the families sign up through MECO headquarters, uh, they don't know where they're going until the district contacts them. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the beauty of it is usually they're connected to some sort of MECO community, so they kind of know about the program, and may, they may be new to the community like Arlington, but they know about the program. We do have one family that was kind of new and focused, um, and it's funny, they're their oldest student went to school with my student. So they're like, oh, this is great. We, we want to stay. Well, you have some folks sometimes that will be like, well, it's a little too far or I'm just not certain. And so they go back in the queue or they have to reapply again the next year if they decline. So MECO is and DESI is working together so that families can have some sort of option of if they want to go large, small, medium, or however they decide to do it. It's still a lot of work being done with it. So. Is the Q um, grade blind as well? So you, we request. So we know, I, I talked to Dr. Homan, where will we have some opens? And we know where there's room for our students. And so that is what I will request. I will never request anything over because um, I don't want to, you know, and not have enough funding and not have enough resources for students coming in. So we want to try to keep it at 75. Um, this year we were at 72, uh, so the, the ideal number is 75 that we want to keep it to. So that's why I have two more in the queue. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Thanks very much. This is a helpful presentation. <clears throat> um, so my questions are these. What, what is the state, the, the, the target for METCO total? Like what's the enrollment target? I think we're at 3,065, I want to say. Yeah. All right. And then because we, we were close to 100 at one point in time in this district. Yeah. So we were, and so I'm just, and I kind of maybe have lost the plot line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, she just said 125. 125, yeah. right. So I, could someone just kind of give me, I'm, I'm, I'm actually forgetting why we went down, because the DESI grant went and down? Our, I, our enrollment numbers our, um, had a big impact, okay. would, be my, would be my guess, okay. that our expanded enrollment meant that we didn't have the space and we didn't have the spots. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that we enroll where there are, where there is room in sections. So as uh, enrollment levels off, we have a little more room. Actually, uh, one of the things that Rochelle and I have been collaborating on is thinking through there's been a, an ask from the Metco Inc. Yeah. group that you consider taking in students who are not kindergartners um, and who the families have decided after a couple of years in Boston Public Schools or wherever their child was at school that they'd be interested in this program. And we may have more room in second grade, for example, mm -hmm. or in, and you know, we're trying to be careful with that because we're not quite sure what the pandemic yep. return is going to continue mm -hmm. to look like, but we may have more spots in other grade levels mm -hmm. than we do in kindergarten. Uh, and we've been using that to make sure that she fills the spots that she has. We would be mm -hmm. open to getting back up to those levels, but we have to make sure we do it in d grade levels <coughs> where we have the enrollment space. Right. Well, you know, one, one thing I noticed when I worked in Boston mm -hmm. was that there are a lot of alumni mm -hmm. of METCO, mm -hmm. or there are children of, of METCO, there were, yeah, so who are kind of promoting the program because we, when I ran a school that competed with METCO to try to get METCO. Oh, yeah. <coughs> you have Kim Janey. Former first woman, yeah, Mecco, right, right. Bruce Brown, NBA, Mecco, yes. Tito Jackson, city councilor, yes. Mecco. <laughs> no, no I, I know that. Yeah, but but their children, sometimes their meaning their children, the yeah. children of the alumni, were kind of yeah. the ones. And so I'm just kind of wondering the overall. I'm just curious about the overall recruitment effort within the city. What does that look like? I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. It's been tough. It has. The demographics of Boston is changing drastically. Mm -hmm. uh, families are moving out. They're going into the South Shore. They're going where they can purchase homes that are affordable. Boston is not affordable. We're looking at three-bedroom apartments, $3,000 monthly to rent. So that, that is high. I mean, that's the, higher than a mortgage. So there are the struggles there. But I believe, like I was hearing Margaret say back behind me, legacy. 
legacy is what's keeping us afloat um, right. because folks are, they know that this program works. Um, it may not work for all, but it's worked for most that ha are out here shining. And a lot of those, those um, students that I know that I went to school with, they're working either in the community or in the community that they went to school in. Uh, and so they're still very much connected. I'm still very much connected to my Newton friends, very much so. And so now I'm excited because I have Arlington friends now. <laughs> All right, thank you, appreciate thank that. Thank you. That Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. So after that lofty part, I wanna focus on something that's much more small. Well, I just thought it was really cool. The picture that you have of the seniors and the sashes that they're wearing. I don't know, maybe I missed them before. I don't know how, no, okay, they're new. Yeah. They are awesome. They're no, cool. it, it's- Akinte Stoles, yes. It was, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, a wonderful thing and I think if the I know some of the seniors have been going back to their elementary schools and stuff and I think if they're they do that and they're wearing this it gives a sense of community and also aspiration to the other you know the the younger kids who are in the program and yes so I don't know whatever we can do to help continue that I think it was a great idea and thank you yes yeah, so that's something I think is like a tradition through Mecco because I remember wearing the Kente stole um, we had them customized this year so it did say Arlington Mecco mm -hmm. and then it said class of 2022 on it so and they I, I was nervous I was like are they gonna wear them because I snuck them in their regalia mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and they all four of them came with it I was super excited to see that so there was some pride there so I think you're you're on to something there they should wear it in I, I think it and i think it's i think having the class and the mech you know all of that bringing it together with words helps and that may be part of what i'm feeling i'm seeing such a difference with that so thank you mr Carden. sorry just a quick note of appreciation for the summer fun program i think it's really the innovative type of thing that we don't you know sometimes we don't see especially in the last two years we haven't seen because of covid but um, you know, I know it took, I imagine it took a lot of work across the administrative Still team working. <laughs> to put that together. So I applaud you all for, for doing that. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I was meeting with Steve for like an hour today, just making sure that transportation is going to be on point. So thank you. This, it was definitely a community effort. So it wasn't just me. It was, a, it was a team. So it was awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, go ahead. no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just want to say this, um, incredible woman hit the ground at a solid sprint, um, if, as you can tell, because that's quite a list of things that she's been working on <laughs> this year. And I really want to commend her for the work that, in particular, she and um, Margaret have done at the Audison with Audison Day. That was a really uh, big undertaking. Then they had to partner with the building leaders. The building leaders did a ton of work on that as well. And it was really a very special day. The kids were energized by it. I know that... Um, that Ms. Thomas is going to talk about it too, but I was just so blown away by the effort that went into that. It's a really great example of the partnership that can happen between our program leaders and our building leaders to make some really awesome experiences happen for kids. Um, and it's been wonderful to have you in this role this year. Oh, thank you so much. I love it here. Thank you. Um, thank you. Most of my comments and questions have been said, so I'll just echo my appreciation for all the work that you've done, and I appreciate your presentation this evening. It was Thank great you. to hear about Mecco. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, and now Ms. Thomas with a diversity, equity, and inclusion update. Welcome. Thank you. All right, hold on. I'm getting slides up. This is what bridging. Um, <laughs> Making that, you know, how we want to increase diversity. That's it. She was two years my, my intern and she wasn't going to apply and I told her she needed to. So I'm so happy that she's here. So thank you for having me tonight, um, Dr. Holman, school committee, um, in this new role <laughs> that I've been in since August of, August 18th, I think is when I started. So. I have mines up here too. Uh, so these are some of my core values that I am trying to live by as I have entered into this new role. Um, as a leader, I live each day to fulfill my commitments. Um, look in the mirror at night and say I intentionally did my best. Um, 
you know, um, we don't wake up thinking that we want to make mistakes. And if I do make a mistake, I am big enough to apologize. Um, innovative, as an innovative leader, should not be afraid to push beyond the boundaries of to dismantle systematic racism. I think Dr. Holman <laughs> is starting to see that a little bit in me. Um, so all can be inspired by their dreams and live them. And then inclusion, as a leader, I want everyone to know inclusion is not just a catchphrase for me, but one that has a personal invitation at the, that everybody has a personal invitation at the table to share their authentic self. And I live that not only professionally, but personally because of my son who has made me an advocate um, in that area. <coughs> so this year, what, <laughs> What is happening is we have never had a diversity, equity, and inclusion director. So I am a trailblazer, and I am establishing the offices of di di um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so where I started was with listening sessions with district and school leadership, um, educators. We did family le um, listening sessions with the LGBTQIA+. BIPOC, Arlington residents, and students who live with disabilities and students. Um, I have bi-weekly meetings with the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Jill, Jill Harvey. We meet every other week, and we meet to discuss how we can partner together with the work she does on the community side, the work I do with the school side, and what can we do together as a team. Um, and I'll get l later to what we have done. I, I also met with the town DEI commissions, human rights, LBGT, LBG, TQIA plus and disability. And um, there were, I, I would go every, maybe every other month to facilitate BIPOC affinity groups with the MECO director, Rochelle Smith, and the social worker, Sheila Lowe. And I'm excited that we're going to do, be doing Flag Day <laughs> um, next Tuesday. So, one of the big things that I really push for um, this year, and um, Dr. Holman, and the cabinet was in agreement with was that we did a district equity audit. Um, that RFP was published at the town late November. Um, we got five to seven, I think it was, um, contractors. We did interviews. We did have stakeholders that sat on those interviews. And then we came into contract with Longview Education in January, and they hit the ground running. Um, what they, the re, where they are right now is that they have finished uh, gathering data and having those participants looking at data. So the subgroups are now reviewing what the assets and the barriers are. Um, that was a good undertaking because we recruited the students, the staff, and community members to be a part of that. So it wasn't just us having a con, a cons, um, consultants come in to do it, and we, I thought it was important, we thought it was important that we had everyone at the table, all stakeholders, to do it. Um, I did an understanding bias and microaggression workshop. This is one thing I did do with Jill Harvey. We did it for town employees and district ed educators, and then I facilitated two with the elementary um, educators on that early release day. We have already facilitated two graduate um, credit courses, one ideas. We did two in the fall. We did one in the fall, one in the spring. We, and then this year we did the ideas two. Um, that is new. Um, we had 14 participants in that. We have total, um, I, I looked at the data today, we have 103 um, people that are still in district who have been, um, who've taken the ideas one course. And the reason why I say still in district, we've had some that have left. Um, so that data has shifted. And then with the ideas too, we had 14 people who have taken it. So we have 14, those 14 people have taken ideas one and ideas two. Um, facilitated an all day retreat for the high school students in March. Um, I have been doing walkthroughs and classroom observations with principals who have asked me to come. And um, I also participated on the Deeper Learning Dungeon Professional Development, which um, I went with the team in May to Canada. And I'm also a member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Job Alike Eastern Regional Organization. That is fairly new. That is that we meet once a month, the end of the, um, once a month on Fridays. 
and um, as you know that these are new positions that are popping up so there's m mostly over there's 30 of us in this group um, and it's really a good group it's a way that I can come if I have a problem with practice we share resources and we also are looking to, we're doing some planning we're looking to um, um, have our superintendents come to talk to us and to talk about the work and then the other thing is um, at all of this I was also in the doctoral program so Boston College uh, the PSAT program I finished my first year while doing all of this successfully finished my first year I should say that and I will start my second year in July oh no <laughs> <laughs> One of the other things that I did was I partnered with ACMI and I have a channel called DEI Matters Conversations with Margaret Credo Thomas and Dr. Holman. She wasn't, I wanted her to be my first guest. Our schedules weren't aligning. However, when she came, we had a wonderful conversation. I hope you all had time to watch it. Um, I've had Jill Harvey on there. I've had, um, uh, Adam and Christine from the town, and I've had uh, three DEI directors that also came. Um, so I plan to continue that next year and to continue to open up conversations, not only with um, educators, but I also want community members. Um, and the reason for that is because I want us to start to have some forward conversations. Any of you all want to? I'm very excited to have you. I do, I do send you the, qu the questions beforehand so you know. <laughs> Um, and yes, this is Audison Day. So Audison Day um, was an exciting time. Um, worked with the administration and Ms. Smith. We met every Monday. Uh, we had 28 facilitators. We had anywhere um, workshops on code switching or being a leader. Dr. McNeil did one of those. I did a workshop on Double Dutch, <laughs> that was fun and exciting. Um, and what I really appreciated is that the kids all got t-shirts. Um, they personalized them themselves. Some of them was walking around, they were writing on their t-shirts mm -hmm. names. Um, the, uh, us as adults, we had t-shirts. The plan is that the adults will wear these t-shirts next year, once a month. Um, and I appreciated the day because it was a day that we wanted the, the, the students to feel like they belong to Audison and Audison belonged to them. It was such an exciting and joyous time for me because you could see there was a difference in the air and that you could see that the kids were enjoying themselves that day. And we also still had the Memorial Day um, celebration in the morning. So there was a lot that was going on. We had therapy dogs. so. This is, this is a team, and I'm excited that um, Audison will have their, their committee that will do this again next year. They want to do this again next year, which is great. And that I'm looking to see how we can also expand this to other schools, because I think this is a way that we create a sense of belonging. So next step, um, we are supposed to get the equity audit recommendations in July um, with Dr. Holman we will analyze and review those um, those recommendations and then have steps of what's next when we get it um, right now we're thinking of hiring a DEI specialist um, and that specialist uh, would be able to design and facilitate some professional development and racial, racial equity learning um, in classrooms and in the Arlington community, and also collaborate with leadership and teachers to expand the special event, events, like I said, like um, Audison Day. And then to continue to collaborate and participate with building leaders in school through walkthroughs and classroom observations. But what I can really say is, depending on what that equity audit states, some of these things might change of what the work will be. Um, and then the last thing is to launch the new DEI website. Um, my year takeaways is that um, people want APS to create a sense of belonging, acceptance, and inclusion in the schools and in the community. Um, people want professional development for district leaders and teachers. The importance of teacher-student relationships and building an inclusive classroom community. 
um, the DEI department to continue listening forums next year to hear students and community experiences and then um, communication on the equity audit recommendations and where we would be going next from there. I think that's it. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Hainer? The, uh, the website that you're talking about, will, will it be just informative or interactive or both? No, so Dr. McNeil has been working with that. That's something that was, that was happening last year. The students were also helping to work on that, and so that's something that I will be looking over to. So it will, it will have what the students have done, um, what D, the DEI office has done, resources, so it, it won't just be resources. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Great job. Thank you. Ms. Morgan? Um, can you tell us the format that, so the equity audit will be sort of a, will be some sort of written document that will be, we, because we, we started one of these a few years ago. The right? curriculum, it was curriculum. Okay. Only That's curriculum, right. yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. this is everything, so this curriculum is, as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay. so this is, there are seven dimensions that we're looking at. It's, um, I wrote them down. It's intervention, policy, professional development, leadership team readiness, student achievement, staffing, curriculum, and school experience, and family and community engagement. And so the consultants asked us for different data sets, and then they, when, when we asked for um, staff and community participation, they are the ones that put the, everyone into subgroups. And so they not only looked at the data sets, they also did empathy interviews. So they are now synthesizing all of that information. Well, no, they already have. So what's happening now is those subgroups are now looking at what the findings are. So they're looking at what the what our assets are and what our barriers are. Okay, great. So are we sort of taking that the the curriculum audit that was done a few years ago? Like, it, it, there are, has that sort of been put on the shelf, and we're going to focus on this one at this point, or like where where are we at with with that one? With the curriculum audit? Yes. Yeah. I know that what Dr. McNeil was doing was working with the curriculum leaders about some of the recommendations in regards mm -hmm. to that curriculum audit. Can I, so I would think of these as paired audits. We okay. couldn't, ha that same individual who did that audit um, didn't have the capacity to continue to finish it and then to do a comprehensive audit. And one of the things that she wasn't able to do was get out into classrooms, whereas this group has been able to visit schools. Um, and so I would essentially put them next to each other, say they're obviously two years removed from one another at this point. Uh, but the findings that she had are still relevant for us to consider now, and then this one sort of boosts that by giving a fuller picture of the entire system. Great. So I don't think, given COVID, and there was there was some real challenges with, with accessing that curriculum audit, I, I, I don't really know why at the time, but um, I, I'm hoping, I saw that Ms. Exton has, um, presentation calendar uh, here for later, but um, I, I, you know, I, I really want to get some kind of readout on that um, equity audit and, and I guess the curriculum audit because we, we really didn't, we've heard we nothing that. about that. Yeah. So um, that would be, mm -hmm. that would be great. Thank you. You're and welcome. we have since unlocked that document. So if you want a copy of it unlocked, we can send it over. That would be great. Make it public. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Dr. <laughs> Mr. Thalman. You know, no, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. It's a very helpful presentation. Mike, Mike, and I know this is that the office is in year one. You're just launching this, and there's a lot to do, and you're one person. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and uh, so I, my, my question to you is, is what's the longer-term strategy to involve the broader community in this conversation? And I'm talking, I'm thinking like PTOs, parents, different mm -hmm. groups. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a good, a good question. So I have a both and an answer for you. One is to, to really look at what the recommendations are going to be from that equity audit. I think that's going to drive the work that we need to do. And then the and for me is just like you said, um, you know, as I was talking to Dr. Holman, one of the things I would like to do is start to work with the community in regards to um, for example, the PTO presidents and looking at the calendar and what are the events that are coming up and um, and, and are they inclusive and, and to start to do that kind of um, proactive work as, as opposed to reactive work. And also the other thing is to really start to educate as we're doing the education in the district to also do the education in the community. So it has to go like this. 
Um, and so for me, it's th those are the pieces, the fate, and they have to be phased in. So we have to understand it's not that we're gonna be able to do everything in one year. We're gonna have to look at what those phases are gonna look like and what is gonna be the key priorities that happen. And I think the key priorities will line up with the strategic priorities that Dr. Holman is also talking about in our vision and mission statement that the new vision and mission statement that we're talking about. So all of that I would be looking at to just see where we begin to work. So we've already begun, so we're slowly building a foundation. And then I think with those key data points, that will help us to understand how to, make, how to design a roadmap in this work. Yeah, I mean, you're good. Uh, that's good. I, I, I have found in my own professional experience, we've done this kind of work in a organization of you know 180 people or whatever it is that is in my organization now the um there's a tendency to have this kind of work owned by a smaller group <laughs> and it's a challenge to get it expanded to a larger part of the community even in a workplace where there's mandates to attend these kind of things so <clears throat> um i'm i'm just i'm i mean you know, i don't have an answer but i'm just kind of curious to see how it's rolled out to a broader community in a way that's inviting and non-threatening yeah, I, th um, yeah. I think working with Joe Harvey is one way that we are working with the community. I think that that was something that I thought that we needed to do right away. She's the town DEI as I'm the, the school DEI. I think also working with the commissions is also important. And I think that's one way that we continue to roll out what we want to do to the community um, because they can help us and to partner with us in that that our net can grow larger that way. So it's, I'm not looking for this to, to land on one to be siloed. We're looking for this to, equity lives everywhere. So we're looking for everyone to live equity. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, that was helpful. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. And first, congratulations on your doctorate program. Thank you. First year, that's awesome. Um, I, Sort of building on what Mr. Thielman had said, um, I'm wondering, so I understand this was your first year and that you know it, it's just been a tremendously difficult year because you're both building a department which has never existed before and you're doing un under COVID conditions which are just crazy. Um, but I'm wondering how you plan to get a bigger, longer-term vision for what your department does and processes and, and things like that. I'm not asking for them now. I'm, I'm just wondering how are you envisioning figuring that part out? Yeah, I, like I said, I think the equity audit will help me to figure that part out. I think when I got into the position, I think there were there are a lot of pieces that are are moving at the same time, and I think the reason why I wanted the equity audit, one, it gives us the data that we need, and two, that I would have the recommendations and suggestions of how, just exactly how, Dr. Amber, you're asking this question, and Mr. Thilma is asking the question, how do we start to do this? How do we start to build this? And how do we expand this department? And I think that's important for us to have that data because then we need to know how we're really supposed to be using our resources um, and I don't want us using our resources blindly, so I, that's why I keep saying that. I feel like that equity audit would be the roadmap that would help to build what, what you all are talking about, how we continue the education in the community, how do we do the equity in the district, and how does that align with our strategic priorities in the vision and the mission statement. Okay, I will add okay. that I think timing has been, has been important here and that this will come back around the same time that we're starting to build action plans for the strategic plan and there are going to be a lot of entry points or opportunities for us to align whatever the equity audit says with what we're saying our key actions are mm -hmm. and nesting them under each of those four priorities mm -hmm. so the the it was you know purposeful that these would land at the same time and give us that opportunity to put them next to each other as we plan the strategic plan okay great thank you very much you're welcome Um, I just, I would love to hear a little bit more about um, how the teachers who have taken the ideas courses, what, what opportunities do they have within the district to get together with each other, to share with teachers who haven't taken the course, just 
the number of teachers who have done that, I think just in the two years that I've been on this committee has, has like grown as exponentially. And so just say more about how. So last year we got the, the people who participated last year, we got them back together. And we asked them um, after taking the ideas one class, how to, has it changed their problem of practice? And I do have the, um, the board with all of those notes. So um, once teachers have taken it, they immediately have um, maybe revised their lesson plans. Or I would, I will never forget a teacher, we did an activity called left hand, right hand, and she was like, I got left handed scissors. So it's like the little things that they start to change starts to happen and now, Ideas too, what's happening is that's more project based. And so teachers were looking at the data and then after looking at the data, they had to think about what their research project was going to be. And so we have about three teams that are looking to design um, culturally responsive uh, lessons to embed them into the curriculum next year. And they do have the go ahead from their principals to start doing that um, and then this year, um, in talking to some people who have taken the ideas course, they do want to get back together. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to set a time once a month that is more like I call them office hours. They can drop in voluntarily, and then we can connect and meet and talk about how are things going. Great. No, that, that's helpful because I think it's, it's important. To, you know, we invest the teachers getting that. Um, having that opportunity and that training, and then we want to make sure that they're sharing it with their colleagues and continuing to grow with one another. So, uh, so I appreciate Yes, they've it. been the best marketing tool. And one more question. Do you find that, um, that it's across, like from K to 12 that teachers are going, or? How, yes, how we've, had, we've had teachers, we've had nurses, we've had school counselors, we've had <clears throat> teacher assistants who have taken the Ideas One course. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Mr. Schleckman? Yeah, hi. Thank hi. you, thank you for uh, everything you're doing. I mean, this is such important work, and because you're in the schools and you're seeing what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, your eyes are important to us, and I'm sure that the, the real advantage of having the equity audit come in is there'll be a fresh set of eyes that, 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 that can look at us objectively uh, and, and, and think about this. One of the things that I think about a lot is that the demographics of this community have changed significantly over the past, say, 10 years. Uh, and I don't know if we are as connected to the changes as we could be or should be. And I'm hoping that within the, the terms of the equity audit that we get there. You, you were with me on the superintendent search yes. subcommittee. and we discussed in the committee how difficult it was to do outreach to certain groups because there wasn't within Arlington a structural organization that we could tap into that other communities traditionally have. Yes. So making connections to communities that exist in Arlington that don't have a, an existing structure that's easy to tap into, I'm seeing that as an urgent need on our part and I just hope that we keep our ears open for that and when the audit is is completed, we can look to find ways and avenues to do outreach to, to new communities in town. Yeah. One of the things I have, I did do this year, is that if anyone wanted to meet with me, any family, I met with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my, um, I did meet with some families of color, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was really important. And it, it was, it was beneficial because then I could explain some things that they just had questions about. So mm -hmm. that's also something that I have been doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas. This was nice to hear about your first year um, as our DEI director. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next item is the first read on the vision statement, mission statement, and strategic priorities for the five your strategic plan. Okay. Dr. Homan? Hold on one moment. Okay. So I'm going to go over first a few process notes and a bit of a timeline to help us sort of understand where we're at with this work um, as it is being actively drafted and 
what some of the things are that we're hoping to discuss tonight. I want to go over a new draft of the vision statement, a new draft of the mission statement, talk about a couple of the adjustments that we've made even in the past 24 hours, thanks to some excellent feedback and a preview of some draft strategic priority statements. So a couple of process notes. First of all, I just want to note that everything in this presentation is still undergoing revision. It is to be treated as a working draft. Um, the strategic planning team is still providing feedback alongside the school committee. That part of this will end next week um, on Wednesday and they won't be providing additional feedback. You all will be making a decision about whether or not to move these forward on the 23rd um, into being the final version or whether or not we need to have more time um, in the summer and keep board crafting these and working with these. Uh, once I come back to you on the 23rd, I will have incorporated all of the feedback from the strategic planning team into whatever version of the um, vision, mission, and strategic priorities that I have for you at that point. So my hope would be that in June of this year, we can finalize the vision and mission statements. Um, and it would be nice if we could also uh, finalize the strategic priorities. Um, but if we need more time on those, that's certainly possible. In the summer, I would like to begin some community dialogues to unpack and process the statements and share some ideas that community members might have for action steps aligned to strategic priorities, because that can inform the actual writing of the plan itself. And then I would, um, we would need to at least finalize strategic priorities if we don't do it in June uh, and start to draft some action steps. And I've given some preview action step ideas as part of uh, this evening's slides, the revised slides that you received earlier today. In fall of 2022, we would want to establish a process for drafting and gathering feedback on a five-year strategic plan. Um, it would be helpful to kind of understand what the expectations are of the committee in receiving and providing feedback on the plan as it's being drafted. I think um, it makes probably some sense, uh, and after thinking about this also with the chair, for this to live in a subcommittee. Um, and I, it's my belief that the CIAA subcommittee might be the best place for it, but we're open to thoughts on that. Um, we wanna make sure that as we're working on drafting this thing that we're in, headed in the right direction and that we don't veer off in the wrong direction. We also want to, um, make sure that by January 2023, we are able to um, approve it and begin working on it. So that's the timeline and sort of where we are up to now. So here's a draft vision statement. This has been tweaked slightly um, from the one that was presented to CIAA yesterday. So the, I'm gonna read these because I think it's nice to hear them read out loud. Um, so the vision would be that we would create an equitable educational community where all learners feel a sense of belonging, experience growth and joy, and are empowered to shape their own futures and make positive change in our world. We do need to have some discussion about the final clause in this one. Um, some concerns or questions or uh, tweaks were raised in yesterday's CIAA meeting. I do want to share that I think the spirit of that final clause, the empowered to shape their own futures and make positive change in our world. The spirit of that from the committee is that there be two ends to this. One is the ability to have, um, or the, the preparedness to have agency over your own path, individual, and the ability to use that agency to better your community or our society. Mm -hmm. So as, I think as long as those two angles are felt in the vision statement, that the strategic planning committee will feel as though the work that they've done has been honored. Um, but how exactly those two uh, pieces get worded is something that we can discuss um, and that I would like your feedback on. As far as the mission statement goes, we've done some grammatical editing to this from the previous version. So the current version is that the Arlington Public Schools will use a whole child approach to cultivate inclusive and innovative learning opportunities for all students, value diverse identities and multiple ways of learning, empower all staff to maintain high expectations while providing necessary supports, and sustain two-way partnerships with families and the community. So four threads mm -hmm. and in crafting statements to go along with each of the priority areas, I have attempted to have a thread between this mission statement mm -hmm. and each of those priority statements. And so I'm hoping you can see that reflected in the priority statements as I go through them. I will say, this is a long statement. <laughs> um, 
if we can make it more concise, that would be nice. Um, and then I also, um, we, we've, we've talked a little bit about whole child, making sure the student is reflected in this statement, um, whether we want to use a term like whole child, which does, it, it is a, um, it's, it is a word that could feel like jargon to some members of the community. Um, and I think that one of the things that a student actually told us as part of the strategic planning was that they don't always know what those words mean. So we, we do want to think about that and what words will best capture the fact that we want to make sure that we really are considering the whole child in our entire approach to the work of the Arlington Public Schools. So for strategic priority one, I've highlighted in green on the next four slides the part that it would be my hope we could approve in June. Um, the part underneath that, the five-year action steps, this is sort of an introductory idea of what some of the actions could be aligned with each one. We can tweak those. They are very drafty. They are just an idea. They're coming from the noise analysis, mm -hmm. the data analysis that the strategic planning committee did. Mm -hmm. Uh, and these are things that came up frequently as make sure you do this, make sure you do this. And there are specific actions that the Strategic Planning Committee also really wants to make sure we do that would get integrated into like one year action steps or maybe three year pieces of those five year larger actions that we want to take on. So the first strategic priority would be ensuring high expectations for equity and excellence. The statement to go with this, the priority statement or goal would be that the Arlington Public Schools will strive for equity and excellence in all disciplines and grade levels and will ensure that all students have the opportunity to access rigorous learning experiences. All graduates at the Arlington Public Schools will be prepared to determine their own futures through pursuit of their choice of career and post-secondary education so that they may contribute as active citizens in their communities. Priority two would be focused on supporting, diversifying, and valuing the expertise of all staff. The statement to go with this one would be that in order to recruit and retain an excellent workforce, the Arlington Public Schools will foster a collaborative and supportive culture for all staff to include high quality and relevant professional development, opportunities for leadership and shared decision making, and expansion of representation, diverse perspectives, and expertise. Strategic priority three is focused on improving infrastructure, operations, and sustainability. The goal statement for this one right now is that the Arlington Public Schools will provide a cost-effective education in schools that are safe, well-maintained, and sustainably operated with the appropriate tools and resources to support best practices and an optimum teaching and learning environment. And the final strategic priority four is focused on developing and sustaining two-way partnerships with families and community. The goal here would be for the Arlington Public Schools to consistently and continuously partner with families in meeting the educational needs of all youth and will provide timely, transparent, relevant, and accessible information to all stakeholders. So I will leave these slides up while we talk. So that way I can page back through them. Um, and I am ready to hear what folks think and what we need to tweak and what we want to adjust. Thank you. I'm going to just move down the line since I'm imagining everybody has things to share. <laughs> Mr. Hainer. Um, your strategic priorities two, three, and four are all quantifiable. Um, and maybe priority one is now the public schools will strive. That to me is, is really open-ended, the word strive. So uh, that's my major comment. Mr. Cardin. Uh, well, thank you for hearing us yesterday and, and turning this around in one day. That's amazing. Um, so I, I guess the, the longer st strategic priority language has not been seen by your advisory committee. Is that right? No, but it is in the feedback form that they're now filling out. Anyone who filled it out, the first 10 people who filled it out, I'm going to reach <laughs> out to explicitly and say, if you want to do it again, there are these new statements in there. But okay. The rest um, of them have it. So I, I imagine there'll be some feedback from, from them, and that will be useful. I, I don't have any major issues for it. Um, but everybody wasn't there yesterday, so I just want to repeat. Um, I, I was the one who raised the, the most concerns about the positive change word, wording, so I just want to you know, repeat um, uh, sort of my, the, the, two, the two primary issues that I see with it. The first is that you know, the vision is describing what we want the district to be. And with that wording, 
one of the few parts of our ideal district is that we are a community where learners are empowered to make positive change in the world. And while that's nice, I don't see that making change is part of our core mission. We should equip students to be civically active, and you have that now in your, your, your more detailed statement. But I don't see specifically empowering change within our schools as a key element in our vision. Secondly, the phrase positive change is unnecessarily charged and isolating. Yesterday at CIAA, we had eighth grade students who came to us requesting that the honors grouping in high school not be changed. By focusing on positive change, I fear we're implying that those students and also the parents who oppose this change and others who, who may at other times oppose their change are somehow unworthy and that focusing on community support or other activities that may not involve change is also less worthy. So I, I appreciate the motivation behind inserting this and I'm happy to discuss that with you know, the committee or others. Um, why I see this problematic, but I do hope we can avoid language that's potentially polarizing. Thanks. Ms. Morgan. Um, so I, um, I've been sort of <coughs> been talking to some of my, some of my people that I go to when I, I have to talk through some of these things. Um, and that I, what I like about the vision, because we're just talking about the vision right now, is that the plan, or are we talking about all of it? I just wasn't sure. What do you want to do? Well, uh, I had thought it was going to be everything. Okay. But mm -hmm. um, so, okay, let's come back. Can we come back to that? So, first of all, um, the in number three, uh, cost effective, mm -hmm. I, can't, I gives me hives. Uh, fiscally responsible would be fine. Um, cost effective like hard pass okay. <laughs> um, on that for me. Um, and um, let's see, can, uh, so I, I'm really, I'm this, the positive change piece, I think for me, what I have a hard time with is that it means, it means different things to every, every for everybody, a positive change is something different. Right, so then it it essentially becomes meaningless at the end because it doesn't mean it means something different to everybody sitting here. What positive change, um, you know? What I mean to Len's point, for students who came to talk to us yesterday, for them positive change would be reverting away from. I mean, in their mind, mm -hmm. right, would be reverting back from any kind of of heterogeneous groupings, um, and and other people feel differently. So it. I think the challenge with it is because it means something different to everybody, it actually maybe doesn't mean anything at all. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I, but, and I, but I appreciate what they're trying to do with this sort of bifurcation and that articulation was important. Um, I can come back with options. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't, I, so I, I am, I am struggling with that piece because I, I don't know what it means. Um, so can we go to the, um, yeah, th so this, I mean, we, we got, we went back to the mm -hmm. whole child that Kersey was asking for, um, so I, this one, I, I haven't had a chance to look at the, the new one, um, but yes, lots of words. So mm. we'll like, mm. well, which is good, right? Like, but it's a lot easier to take words out than it is to put them in, mm. right? So I think that's, um, it feels like it has the, this one to me feels like it has the pieces. Mm -hmm. Like it, the pieces are, are very much there mm. and I don't have none of, none of these pieces are pieces I don't understand. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then can you go to the first one? Um, the second one, sorry. So this one, um, supporting and valuing the expertise of all staff, but diversifying, 
I, I get what we're trying to, I, I get we want to diversify our staff, <laughs> right? But, but we can't, we, supporting all staff, valuing the expertise of all staff, that works. Diversifying all staff doesn't work, right? So I, I don't know how to, um, so I, t I totally support the priority, but it, um, the, the diversification piece, I don't know, I don't know how we address that in there. So it's supposed to, all right, this is a grammatical challenge mm. again. Um, it's supposed to be that supporting is one thing, diversifying, supporting all staff, diversifying all staff, and valuing the expertise of all right. staff. So I got to figure out how to. Yes, but we can't, diversifying all staff doesn't make any sense to me. We want to no, diversify right. our staff or diversify. Okay. I, I, does it. that make sense, yes. right? Like, and, and we can't actually diversify the staff that we currently have, right? We can't <laughs> change them. We can't make them something different. I, I'll right? work on mm -hmm. that. Um, and then, can you go to three? Yeah, hold on one sec. I think that's the cost effective one, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but other than that, no feedback on that one. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cardin and Mr. Hainer, do you want me to come back? No, no, no. I'm, I'm oh, you're, okay. All right. Mr. Slickman. Okay. Um, I was of the other opinion on the vision statement in that the very first uh, public school in uh, North America was in Massachusetts, and the trend towards public education was strongest in Massachusetts. Uh, even before we became a state. Uh, and one of the reasons is this quirky little way we run our governance and that uh, participation of the community is expected or certainly was expected within the boundaries of some very discriminatory uh, boundaries of who was allowed to participate. But it was expected for members of the community to participate in governance and the representative town meeting we have and the open town meetings that are elsewhere in the state are aligned to the core belief of the mission of public schools from when it started that we are all agents of change and agents of action within our communities. And so that uh, the education wasn't just to make people good clerks, to, to enable them to read or do the, do, do the minimum. Uh, the aspiration of public education from the beginning in Massachusetts was to have uh, adults who are able to engage in the process of town governance and to make change, which we saw on April 19, 1775, when a bunch of angry uh, locals were out, outside here uh, confronting uh, the, um, the, the British regulars. Um, so I really like the statement of making positive change in the world. We're not defining what that is, and we don't know what that's going to be. And even in, in the course of town meeting, there were different visions of what positive change would be. and there are dissenting opinions to the outcome and, and we have to honor them all. So I don't, I, I like this, I really like this. I think the other critical word in the vision statement that was really important that came from the students uh, is the phrase empowered to shape their own futures because the, the feedback that my groups heard from students who were within the group was we don't want this to be something where you're doing stuff to us. Uh, we want this to be for us and supporting us, but we want to have our direction in our lives. We don't want you telling us where we're going. And, and I think that phrase is a really critical thing that was pulled out of there, and I'm really pleased that, it, that, it, that it's included. The mission statement touches all bases. Um, it's long. Um, uh, but it is what it is. I think that we've got a lot of stuff we're looking to do, and I think it's an appropriate mission statement. Um, on priority two, I see where the grammatical issue is playing, and I'm not going to sit here and say I have a solution for making it work, because I don't. Um, it, it's what the 
adjectives are modifying, are we supporting the expertise of our staff? I think we are. Are we diversifying the expertise of our staff? I think that one of the goals is to bring more diverse experience into the collective of our staff and supporting that and sharing that. So that we're not diversifying the staff, we're diversifying the expertise. And by bringing in people with new ideas uh, is important. And valuing the expertise of the staff was another one of those very critical things that we heard within the, the, the groups is that teachers also felt that there was a lot of top down in our professional development. And they wanted something different. They wanted this to be more uh, emerging more from their expertise. So the instinct is just terrific to get this together. And I do like the fact that diversity equity is woven into this rather than being number five down the end. And we'll get to that when we want it. It's, it's, it's sort of living and breathing through the document. Uh, I mean, I, I think that Kersey and I had the experience of participating in the process. So we have a different set of eyes on what we're looking at as opposed to my colleagues. I, I don't know how to express how, how this really emerged from a, a large group. And, and it's been very well distilled and the fact that we're sort of debating tweaking rather than saying, no, this doesn't make any sense or this doesn't really represent what the thinking is out there, I think this is a really positive sign. I, I'm really impressed by the document. I'm impressed by the work of the people. I'm impressed by the opinions that were put on the table. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed by the ability of the leadership of this district to collect such an impressive group of people to talk together. Um, and I thought that the, the facilitation was top notch. So this, this is the result of some really good work. And that, that has led us to a really good document. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I first I want to ask some questions about process and then I have mm -hmm. some comments. So first is, so where are we at now? Uh, in, in terms of the, this is the first read. Yes. We're going to do a second read on the 20. Third, between now and the 23rd, who's doing the editing? Yeah, so. so is it, in other words, is it now at this committee and it's over, it's not going to be any more involved by anyone else in the district, or is, or is this the group that's going to do the final editing? So what I was planning on doing was getting, so the committee has until Wednesday to provide me with feedback through a form on all of this. I was, I'm working with the facilitators right now who are watching that come in and then they're meeting on either Wednesday night next week or Thursday morning to take a look at that and send me, I'm gonna be trying to synthesize it too, but they're gonna send me some like, here's what we're noticing. People really like this, they wanna tweak this, they really like this, they wanna tweak this. Um, I was gonna use that on Thursday of next week to build a draft for you all that I could send to you on Friday and then I can either have conversations with you, we could try to put a CIAA meeting together quickly to have a discussion, but I was gonna gather feedback from all of you on it, try to turn a revision around by Tuesday so that you'd have your materials by Thursday on the 23rd. Yeah, so it seems to me that there like needs to be a deadline as to when the editing will stop within the district, and then the school committee has to go through a process to take a vote. And at this table, since it's a second reading, someone could come forward if they wanted to and make a motion to amend the, the statement that we're going to adopt, right? Because that'll yep. be at the second reading. That's, yep. that's how the rules work here. So <clears throat> it seems like that there's got to be some hard deadline. We've got to be told that's it. There's no more editing internally. It's now your document. It make would be the Tuesday that I submit that last draft to this group for your meeting on Thursday. Tuesday the 21st, so two yes. days before the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's as fast as I could possibly move. And if that's too fast, that's okay. We can come up with. Yeah, I mean, that's we'd an aggressive. Have to meet, we'd have to meet. <clears throat> that's an aggressive 48 hour turnaround to kind of it think. Is. And, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, I mean, I don't know. It's up to everybody here. I'm, I'm only one guy. Um, well, okay. So, um, okay, that, that's good to be aware of. Okay, so my, my first question is you know, I, um, I always assume 
that when young people are empowered to shape their own futures, they're going to make positive change in the world. I mean, I just assume they're going to do that. So for me, that make, make positive change in the world isn't really necessary because once we empower them, they'll do great things that will change the world. And I also believe that <clears throat> people who are empowered and educated will <clears throat> do all sorts of things that will change the world in different ways that are, that are positive and impactful, and you never quite know what they are. The other thing is this is a pet peeve of mine, which isn't really um, – maybe a lot of people in town don't care about, but when you say in strategic priority number one, <clears throat> so that they may contribute as active citizens in their communities, there are some students in the Arlington Public Schools that are not able to You're become totally citizens right. of the United yeah. States. Yeah. 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 That so one. that's not mm -hmm. yeah, an inclusive yeah. phrase we'll for, for me. Okay. Yeah. Then <clears throat> the next um, thing I noticed in the draft that you and I talked about the other day in the uh, with the first read, we, we had in there ensuring all students graduate prepared to enter and complete post-secondary education, pursue their choice of current contributors. And then in the, and then I guess you made this change. Here. Yeah, so you brought it up to the top, is that what you did? It's, you? it's right here. It's <coughs> in the statement now, yeah. it's, it, as opposed to the action yeah. steps, because it's more of a goal than an we'll action. Turn it on for you just to pursue mm -hmm. your choice of current uh, Yeah, so, um, good, okay, so there it is, all right, okay. Um, and then, yeah, okay, so I think it seems to me that if, if you're going to, so Tuesday's your deadline, so I think we should have a CIA meeting on Tuesday, and we should all talk about it, and we should try to make sure that it's a time that works for all seven. Work yeah, so if it's humanly possible, I don't know what I'm even doing that day, but yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, that's what I think. <clears throat> thank you. Yep. thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so to kind of circle back to what uh, Mr. Schlickman was saying um, about the positive change aspect, I felt that that was really the sense of the group, mm -hmm. that that came out, I mean, of the strategic plan group, that mm -hmm. to me the vision statement is like the star that we're reaching towards. Mm -hmm. and that was part of the star that they wanted to see. Um, I wonder, just in terms of wordsmithing, if people would feel better if, and, and I personally feel like they wanted to see it separate from just empower their own future and assume that that's going to be the fallout. Um, I wonder if improve our world would be a less controversial phrase that captures some of the same uh, sentiment. Don't say. <laughs> just like, uh, I, I mean, I'm hearing these things anyway. for the first time, so it's hard to yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 I'm, I'm looking down the lane, not just uh, Mr. Thinwood. Um, Sorry. So, okay, mission statement, I think it's great. I mean, it, you know, yeah, we can see if we can cut out a word or two here, but it, it hits all of the notches. Um, the uh, strategic priority one, I wonder if participants instead of citizens, Citizens is coming no, from what we're supposed to, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, what the state wants us to do. So this, uh, but I understand that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. And I think participants would hit those goals. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I want to, I'm very, I'm amazingly impressed at Dr. Homan's ability. It, you folks have to understand, I mean, the people who didn't go to CIA have to understand that I am, we mentioned that what it was before was bullet points. There wasn't a statement, and we kind of pointed out that some of the, you know, it's like some of these are action items, and some of them, they're, they're not really defining the priority. And so Dr. Holman took those and created these paragraphs from yesterday to today. So all these paragraphs that you're seeing for strategic priorities didn't exist 40 hours, 40 30 hours ago, 30 hours ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a problem with her setting herself a Tuesday deadline. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's eight whole more hours. You know, <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm just yeah, saying. We're great. <laughs> um, so. Um, I think we're worried about the, that deadline for us. For not us. For yeah, it's a, I don't, I don't I, actually that, I'm, I'm, I'm making it her. for us. I'm, I, <laughs> okay. Although I do. Oh. Okay. I do care about the superintendent's work-life yeah. balance. I just, I just want to be on the record okay. for that. Okay, but, but I'm also not hearing 
tons of disagreement or, or you know, that it's not, you know, I'm not hearing lots of, I mean, maybe it will pop up later, but okay, so I'll, I'll just keep marching through like everyone else has. Um, so priority two, I have to think about this one. Um, so I have no comment right now, but I, I mean, priority three, okay, I agree, cost effective, fiscally responsible is much better. But other than that, I am so impressed that you've put what I was hoping to capture in one fairly concise, I mean, <coughs> concise for something like this statement. Mm -hmm. So that was cool. Um, and um, the priority four, I understand that you state provide transparent, et cetera, accessible information to all stakeholders. I feel like you're missing, I know that's meant to be communication, but I feel like that mm -hmm. is missing. I mean, that, that's with that phrase, you're missing the sense of communication, which is the whole point. Could it be communicate, or timely, transparent, relevant? As no, but, to provide. but by communication, I mean partly back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so I don't, I can't edit that on the fly, but I'm, mm -hmm. that, that's my okay. reaction to that. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's the main thing. Um, so I think just circling back to the vision, I do. You know, we did gather 60 some odd people from the community. Mm -hmm. uh, I really did feel that what I heard mm -hmm. during that process was a desire for mm -hmm. our students to improve our world or, or however you want to mm -hmm. phrase it. Mm -hmm. um, now, I understand that's, other people have different views about that, but I'm just, I want to be sure that everyone understands that that was mm -hmm. really something that mm -hmm. came out of the process. Um, we could probably pull out artifacts to show that, but mm -hmm. if people wanted to see it, but I'm just saying mm -hmm. from my point of view that that was something that came out. So that's enough. Um. So first, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Holman and the AEF um, for, uh, for funding this process. And I think that um, it's been really intense and thoughtful and you've gotten a lot of um, input from a lot of different community members that I, you know, I understand and appreciate that Ultimately, the seven of us are, are making the final decision on what's here, but it feels from um, the process and from hearing from the committee members that were a part of the um, Strategic Planning Committee uh, that, that it's been, um, that a lot of voices have, mm -hmm. have contributed mm -hmm. to this. And so while I appreciate that we're gonna wordsmith it a little bit, uh, I, I think that it's important that it's something that's coming from the community. Um, so just in ter terms of some of the specifics, um, I'm wondering, so I hear the sort of what one person considers a positive change, someone else is not going to feel as a positive change. So I'm wondering if something, and people have mentioned things and I know you're taking notes and I didn't take everybody's notes, but, um, things like having an impact on the community, um, or I know Mr. Schlickman mentioned it's just the concept of agents of change. Um, and so that it's making change, but not necessarily qualifying the, the type of change so that people don't um, feel that. Um, I also s sort of jumped at uh, the term citizens and mm -hmm. thought of things like participants, contributor, member, um, but just making sure that that's, that's an inclusive um, identifying phrase. Um, and then I, again, I think the mission statement, actually I have a different. <coughs> um, I, I know, the, so the whole child, as an educator, like I get it, but I do worry about how the community m interprets that phrase, or maybe I think I get it because of how and I perceive that term, but I don't, <laughs> 
So I'm just wondering, and I, without making it even longer, like what is, what is it that we mean when we say whole child? And it's like ju not just academics, but social emotional and um, interpersonal. And so uh, I'm still thinking about that um, phrase. And then the last um, number four with the communication, and I think this was what some of what Dr. Allison Ampi was getting at was um, it says two-way partnerships in the heading, but then feel, and I see it says partner, but then it says like providing information, and it's sort of like where is the, the 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 getting the information from from stakeholders as well. So I think those are all of my um, comments. We've been at this for. 30 minutes, but if anybody feels like they want to say something that they didn't get to say before or thought of anything, I'm open to. Just to clarify, the, the, the idea of the meeting is so that we can have this kind of conversation mm -hmm. about wordsmithing mm -hmm. 48 hours prior to the, so there's not motions made to mm -hmm. amend that night. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the intent is we're going to just so that, because I, for me, I may need I may need all the things we're going to vote on at some point in, in one place. color. Well, just one color, maybe. Okay. <laughs> just just like well, because this is going to get it's going to get kind of you know. So so we're going to vote on the the red things and the green things and the green things. Yes, I would okay. put them in one document. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that would be what would become that policy mm -hmm. that's currently in the policy manual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Thelen, I just want to make sure I understand. So, you're suggesting that we have a full committee. We have a CIA, CIA meeting. Okay. Try to get everyone there. Okay. Right on the twenty first. Yeah, you know, we try okay. to get everyone there. Do the best we can to have a time that works okay. for everybody, right. and then we can have this fine. conversation. Okay. Now, yeah. thank you. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So we're not editing it in the fly. Meeting it. No, that's what I'm suggesting. Right. Thank I you. I have a sweater. Okay. So we're finished. This everyone feels this. Com okay. Can I just say, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been. Uh, this has been really awesome to experience with our community members and I've gotten to know a lot of people through this which has been really valuable and it has um, honestly validated and solidified for me some of the things I knew we needed to work on because I've gotten to hear stories like real stories from folks who have experienced some of the things that I heard um, in listening sessions and saw in data but it, it was a really collaborative opportunity too for people to demonstrate you know how the way I experienced this versus the way you've experienced this and for people to surface um, things that they are both inspired by and excited to see happen in our schools and things that we really need to work on so I have really valued the opportunity to do this work and I'm grateful to all of you for supporting it and for and, and for the lengthy discussions that we've had this week um, because it's making these much better so mm -hmm. thank you thank you and sorry miss fronte I, I i didn't even acknowledge you at the beginning but do you want to say anything about this before we move on um, no i'm going to leave that for i think it's more appropriate for the president to come okay. all right thank you thank you um okay so this is a job description approval for a specialized support paraprofessional ed coach supporting students in MAICEI program at Middlesex Community <coughs> College. Mr. Spiegel or Ms. Elmer, do you want to explain this? Sure. Um, we mentioned this at um, CIAA. Yeah. So the Macy program is the Massachusetts Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Initiative, which um, partners with community colleges to provide um, community college experience to students who will not meet um, local graduation requirements and will typically um, you know, stay um, within their public school system until they um, age out around the age of 22. So we have historically partnered with Lab Collaborative and students have attended Macy um, program through the Lab Collaborative. However, we're gonna be a direct partner with Macy next year um, through a grant that they have. And one of the commitments we as a district make is providing the ed coach who will accompany the two students to the um, community college. So this is that position. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All right, so on a motion by Mr. <coughs> Thielman, second by Mr. Cardin. Does anyone want to discuss 
the position. <laughs> the temperature. It's freezing. Oh. No, I yeah. Jane, <laughs> Jane, wait a minute, that sensor on the wall. It should do it. Jane, just vote here. You did it. Mr. Spiegel. Um, so it's an incentive. Sorry. For okay. Her. Okay. <laughs> Back to the job description. So, so the one thing is um, this program right now is at Middlesex Community College. We may want to expand the definition in case we have in the future place students at Bunker Hill or other community colleges um, because I think. Yeah, true? a concern was after we met with you um, um, for CIA, we just, they, they have, it is throughout the state that they have the Macy program at several community colleges. We're happening, mm -hmm. we're happening to partner with uh, Middlesex. We plan to continue partnering with Middlesex, mm -hmm. but there are other. Yeah. So, so I think we may just, the only modification might just be or other community colleges in the state or something like that because <coughs> just so it's not limited just to Middlesex if, if it expands in the future. Mm -hmm. is, is the name of that program unique to this community college? No, the Macy program is, is a Massachusetts initiative. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, students in Macy and mm -hmm. stop it there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well. Yeah. That. I think, I think we, we want to be clear that it is a community. Yeah, that it's off-site. And that it's you're at, off-site at community colleges. Okay. It's someone who would be part of the specialized support paraprofessional is sort of the new title for um, specialized paraprofessionals in the, in the unit D uh, bargaining unit. So, yeah. Mr. Hainer. I, it, if, if this job description is set up so that it meets the criteria for this community college, if there's an intent later on, possible intent to expand it, it may require a change in the, the job description or increase in salary or whatever it is. Oh, no, no, no. It, we were just in, in case that was a location change. Yeah, it, they wouldn't go to multiple colleges. Oh. They would ju it just might be instead of at Middlesex or it might be at both. I mean, I don't know how big it gets, but. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and we just didn't want to restrict it mm -hmm. um, and someone say, no, I, yeah. you know, my position yeah. was to go to Middlesex, not to go to <laughs> Thank Bunker Hill. Okay, so it would read specialized support paraprofessional ed coach supporting students in Macy program at Middlesex Community College or other community colleges. Okay, so a motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Mr. Cardin. Any other discussion? Mr. Hayner. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Slickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. And I'm yes. It's unanimous. Keep going. Uh, Mr. Mason, monthly financial report. Good evening, school committee members. Uh, tonight, um, you'll have you'll see multiple documents in Novus uh, that will include the previous monthly report um, that was a few weeks ago, um, and then as of yesterday, I had an updated report that I submitted the school committee for your review to give you more up-to-date finances which showed some adjustments um, we'll start with the general fund report uh, do you want me to pull your slides up yeah you can I don't have the Google slide version I only have the PDF I can project it though as you talk through it yeah you can mm -hmm. I will do that keep going um, so we'll, we'll start with the general fund um, report Currently, we're at about $67 million expended, which is another about another $10 million from the previous time I reported uh, to, to this committee. And our encumbrances have been brought down to about $12.9 million with uh, projected expenditures around $100,000. Um, there's no more projecting department budgets down, balances down to zero, with the projected remaining balance of $20,000. Now, I will say that that projected remaining balance uh, fluctuates day to day based on when expenditures come in. Um, I'm actually seeing that balance go up this, the, uh, this afternoon as we were informed about um, the district being relieved of paying um, for an assessment cost. Um, so that <clears throat> balance actually is currently as of June, uh, June 9th would be $70,000, but I'm sure that there are other expenditures that I, I'm probably missing because depart departments lag some time on informing us there are some of their expenditures. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, and so some of the projected expenditures, I think that um, if you go, there you go. This one? Yeah. So um, 
There is a credit that's a, a, a credit transaction that we're still waiting to post, which we'll post at the end of the year, um, which is for the circuit breaker transfer. That's what you'll see is a as a negative number in the projected expenditures, as well as uh, we're anticipating a refund from from overpayment of tuition, and then. Um, we are, I have some money set aside for some potential additional salary payments for additional work that our, our staff done over the course of the year for final uh, what we call green sheet submissions. And then um, we're anticipating uh, another $400,000 from electricity expenditures. The invoices do lag um, compared to what you're seeing, so we we'll probably won't see those final invoices until after the close of the year. And then um, there's a few other operational needs from the facilities department, it's about around thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars. So we we'll move on to special revenue. Um, we started off around five point three million dollars at the start of the year, after doing some re recalculations, um, and we're projecting to have a remaining balance of our of the main special revenue funds that we look at, around five point two million dollars, meaning we're slightly decreasing. Um, mainly due to some utility, additional utility costs um, that will actually will level off in July with the new um, uh, contract for our energy agreements and um, as well as some projects that have put, that are we're currently projecting to, to occur, which you, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, um, I'm still holding off. We still have an encumbrance for a $50,000 vehicle that we spoke about earlier that uh, waiting to get that replaced. Um, we have a contingency uh, for $30,000 for additional spaces in our summer projects um, that we may need um, according to the facilities department. Um, what I did have previously on the report and held was about $328,000 that was tied to ventilation equipment. That was for the Dallin School um, in, in order to preserve our reserves um, for the next year. Um, we are actually going to use it to move it to ESSER II funding, um, which is, this is appropriate for that funding. It wasn't part of our capital plan, and it is also to ensure the safety of our students and reduce the possibility of COVID spread. Um, we're also, we're still, we're still working on the Pierce HVAC uh, issue in the classroom 127. Um, we, we bought the parts, that we estimated about $30,000 worth of labor. Um, and we still have a hold for the fire control, access control panel at the Bishop School, um, which is important. If you move to the next slide, um, just to speak to our grants, um, our total, you'll see in the report that there's additional added grant for premium payments. Um, that's a basically an in and out just to report that um, the town, uh, that was what we, the town paid out in total. But our total awarded grants is around 6.7 million. That's excluding the AEF grants. Um, and we're projecting a carryover of 1.4 million in, ESSER, in um, ARPA funds. That's between um, the general ESSER three and then the additional S uh, ARPA special education grants that we receive that we'll use in next fiscal year. I'll now open up to any questions. Mr. Slickman. Yeah, uh, will we be anticipating uh, requests for budget transfers at the end of the, at the next meeting? Yes. Yes. Mr. Hainer. I just want to add, uh, EDCO uh, officially uh, took a vote today. It will close uh, on June 30th. The last EDCO board meeting was today. I'm bringing it up now because we've met all our obligations and it looks like we will be getting uh, some reimbursement uh, in the next couple of months. Um, it's because we were overcharged. That's why we're getting it back. Some good news. If I, I'll just add to that, is that um, I do have to talk to the comptroller to see if those funds that do get back, come back from EDCO come back to the school committee funds or does it go back to free cash? So I never said anything. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I've got the picture. 
<laughs> He's going to kill me. <laughs> Mr. Mason's too humble to tell you this, but I hope you'll join me in congratulating him because he was accepted into an MBA program at Boston University today. Uh, Congratulations. Part time, I hope. <laughs> he will very much still be here while he gets that master's degree. <laughs> Dr. Allison Yampi. So I'm trying to anticipate what we're going to need for next, our next meeting because unfortunately I will not be here um, because I have an unavoidable family conflict. Um, for end of the year funds, um, Mr. Cardin had talked about that the way that we could put money into the special education reserve was to work out ahead of time that it goes to free the, the goes to the town's free cash they know it's ours and then at the next town meeting it gets removed and and um, put into the special education <coughs> reserve um, and I'm wondering I, I see that at least I looked at the uh, period 11 things and I saw at that point you were recommending prepaying out of district tuition, but if we wanted to do the special education reserve, do we, I'm assuming we need to do it before the end of the fiscal year. I mean, that we need to state that we're doing that. So um, I'm looking for guidance on what we as school committee need to do to help make that happen. So if I don't know at what point do you, would the school committee, so if I could, if we could meet as a budget subcommittee, if you have time within the next week, yeah, yeah. I would prefer to give you an updated number because okay. of certain things that are anticipating to yeah. come back in right. and things that actually happened today and got cleared up. Um, but I, I don't know if you say like under $100,000 what do you want to do, right? Oh, it, yeah, you know, yeah. and so right now with the with the additional, due to what the new building not being negotiated in the, the old electricity contract mm -hmm. and uh, the expenditures that we've incurred in this budget and we were able to hold, um, that project, that money that I thought we had now is pretty much evaporated. Oh, okay. So, okay. so and some of what, some of the, some of the things that Dr. Holman and I have been discussing about how to shift funds around, which is around priority, making sure that the funds that are in our like building rentals and foreign tuition are kind of alleviated for this year, which will then give the school, the school committee greater flexibility for the next year's budget. Right. I'm, I'm more just trying to make sure that we're using our funds in a fiscally responsible way. Um, I understand, I, I think what was said about Funds needing, you know, if we get a reimbursement from EDCO, I think that does rightly go to free cash. You know, we're not going to quibble um, if if that's how it happens. But I was operating out old data that suggested there was money um, that might either go to the special education reserve or mm -hmm. out of prepaying out of dis new out of district mm -hmm. tuitions. Mm -hmm. Um, either of which I think is a fiscally responsible use of those funds. If the money now, you know, like I said, it, it's, it's in flux because there's uh, a lot of moving parts. If that money doesn't exist, then it, it, you know, we're happy that we're stay, you know, that we're not going under, you know, that, that we're, um, our, balance, our budget is balanced. Yes. Um, and yeah, we can certainly have a budget subcommittee next week. Yes, I, I just, yeah, I guess I don't want to waste the time of, you know, of the, of the subcommittee. I, if there's like a percentage threshold of what the school committee wants to consider. We, we have other things we need to discuss. We'll just set up a meeting. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, Superintendent's report, Dr. Holman. All right. Um, 
I'm hopeful that my updates next year will not always start with these graphs, uh, <laughs> but in the interest of consistency, we'll just end the school year with them a couple of more times. We are very pleased that rates have gone down precipitously in the schools. It's helping us keep classrooms staffed as we close out the school year. Um, and everybody wants to be there for the celebratory last few events. And we're also seeing a bit of a downturn in Arlington, though I haven't updated with this week's numbers quite yet. We do have a number of administrative hiring searches that are going, um, and Mr. Spiegel will let me know if I missed any on this list. We uh, have welcomed, as I mentioned last time, Kim Visco as our new K-12 wellness director. Um, a recent update is that we are excited to welcome uh, K-12 visual arts director, Leo uh, Mjolnir, who is coming from, remind me, can you? Acton Boxborough. From Acton Boxborough. Um, amazing expertise. He's a Cambridge resident. He's an active artist. Uh, he just blew the committee away in both his interviews with myself um, and Mr. Spiegel as finalist in his forums with members of the community and in his initial interviews with the committee. So we're very excited that he'll be joining us. Our K-12 Director of History and Social Studies search is in its final stages, and we're hoping to announce that early next week. Uh, Bracket Assistant Principal search is in its final stages, as well as the Arlington High School Special Education Coordinator. Yes, or did you land on a candidate? We're still working on that from your face. Yeah, still working on yeah, that. Yes, still working on that. <laughs> um, Stratton Assistant Principal and Audison Assistant Principal positions are posted as they um, move on to new adventures. The Audison Assistant Principal will be a principal in Reading next year and our K-12 Director of Fine and Performing Arts role is now posted. That was a position that was part-time. Um, we've actually had all of our part-time directors um, decide that, I think all, yes, all, decide that they would not be returning next year and are, fine, are going to retire. Um, and so we are posting all of these as 1.0 positions because all of these roles always needed to go beyond whatever the part-time was. And we've expanded our enrollments. These programs have expanded. We want them to be rich programs. Uh, we're very excited <coughs> to welcome full-time folks on. It obviously has an impact on the budget. Um, a lot of these are, right, we did have three reserve positions and we haven't used those for any um, classroom teachers or homeroom teachers at the moment. So we're working it out and we'll have revised budget um, plans for FY23 to the Budget Subcommittee and School Committee once we have those ready, but um, we are expanding those roles into full-time positions, um, and so we're excited to do that as well. Also included in your materials is the hiring memo that Mr. Spiegel and I sent to administrators so that you can see what our expectations were for hiring searches um, at the schools, and that applies not only to these administrative searches. We try to model what we want to see at the schools, uh, but also to any searches that they were doing at the school level. A few additional updates. I want to congratulate the very accomplished class of 2022. We had a beautiful graduation ceremony um, last Saturday. It was a perfect day. It was about 75 degrees and sunny, and the graduates uh, looked fantastic. And I will say the speeches from the kids took the day. They had absolutely the best speeches of anyone, and they did an absolutely fantastic job. So it was really a wonderful time to celebrate the accomplishments of this class that's been through really quite the roller coaster ride um, through their high school years and it doesn't seem to have slowed them down one bit. Um, I gave the science camp update earlier. I'm happy to discuss if the committee has any questions. As a before school programming update, um, we did a survey. We have received responses from that. Of those responses, 41 families across all of the elementary schools said yes, they need and would use before school care. 26 families indicated that they may use it on an as needed basis. So at some schools, this is these are enough families to potentially offset, depending on what the cost was for this per day, um, the cost of staffing it, assuming that we can get staff to staff it. So we're taking a look at that now, figuring out what the cost out would be and what we would need families to pay in order for us to have a competitive wage to get people willing to come in early enough in the day to actually staff a before school care program. We need to also think about who's going to coordinate that, um, basically who's gonna be the admin on duty at seven o'clock in the morning to make sure that uh, we're at all, across all of the sites that these are staffed safely and that the, if a staff member can't show up that we know that they can't be there and that we can communicate with families. So it is, a, it is an undertaking to get this programming together this swiftly um, and we're taking a look at what might be possible and whether or not we can accomplish it. 
The website stakeholder survey also went out. We had 216 families and 75 staff responses. Uh, we learned from families and community members that the website is accessed primarily for event information. That was the overwhelmingly biggest response. Uh, contact information, school information, and lunch menus. Um, very important, those lunch menus. Mm -hmm. I know this now as a parent myself of a kindergartner. That's what we look at the website for. Um, <laughs> the biggest challenges people reported were finding the right information. Um, 225 people said that's the biggest challenge they have when they visit the website. Too many clicks to get to what I need. Um, and a lack of design consistency. And that's really across, like, when you go to a school's website, it looks different from this school's website, uh, or this organization's website looks different from that organization's website. Um, it's really uh, challenging for families to sort of know where to go in the website when the design consistency isn't there. So right now we're doing design and mi migration work for the website. We've picked out um, a theme, and we're working right now on what the navigational menus will look like. The a vendor will do all of the move of content over and then we get to go in and manipulate and take things out that we don't think need to be there or move things around. Uh, we're going to open with the migration of the district website and the three school websites that are already integrated into the district website. I believe those are Gibbs, Hardy, and Dallin. And then we will start the migration process during the course of the year next year of all the other school websites that are currently on different platforms and managed by different groups and um, that makes it particularly challenging to sort of rein all of this into one um, sort of consistent looking site. But we are looking forward to a launch, hopefully um, prior to the start of the school year in 2022. So that will be very exciting. Um, a Deeper Learning Dozen update. We, ha we really enjoyed our partnership with them this year. I wanted to get us to a convening and then get feedback from my team as to whether or not we wanted to continue our work with them. Last year was a free year with the Deeper Learning Dozen and that they paid for all travel um, for membership in the organization and for food once you were there and everything else. Next year is not, and they're still working on what their model will be, and so I'm working with them on this right now. It looks as though it would be that uh, membership would not cost us anything, and once we're at the conference, things like food um, and accommodations wouldn't cost us anything but the travel to and from May. The convenings next year, luckily, though, are in Kentucky, which shouldn't be as expensive of travel accommodations. Um, Revere, which is here, and uh, the other one would be in San Diego. So it shouldn't be um, an extreme cost if we do choose to stay with Deeper Learning Dozen. Uh, I know that our team would really like to maintain the work that we've started with them this year. It's been informative to our leadership practice and the work that the cabinet team has been doing to um, act in unison with one another and really row in the same direction. And so we're looking into what our options might be to continue that partnership. If anybody <coughs> has any questions, I'm happy to take them and then your enrollment reports are in your folders as well. I do want to note for enrollments that we are take we are keeping a very close eye on Stratton fourth and fifth grade. Mm -hmm. We've had some move outs in fourth grade and we know of a few more that are coming and we've had some move ins in fifth grade. Um, so we may choose to have a section move from fourth to fifth in order to balance those sections out. Um, that's something that we're keeping a very, very close eye on right now. And that's all I have. Dr. Allison um, Dr. Homan, mm -hmm. just in, in terms of the website, um, when you're rolling it out to other schools, I would suggest getting the high school in early just because it affects so many mm -hmm. people compared to all the other ones. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Cardin. Uh, just going back to the science mm -hmm. camp discussion, I appreciate um, your commitment to um, undertake some outreach, but I think. Um, uh, I mean, that needs to be done because there needs to be a community conversation about it. It was something that was mm -hmm. lost because of the pandemic, um, and then there was sort of silence. Um, so there's sort of suspicion about, you know, there, there, there was some talk about problems with the program. You identified some of them, um, but the community needs to hear about that and also hear about, like you, like you, you, you presented, what, what, what are we going to do going forward? So I do think, um, I don't know if you want to send out an email about it or, just wait until September and, and have, you know, work with community relations to mm -hmm. do a forum, but um, I do think there needs to be some conversation about it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I just want to get kind of... I'm sorry. Yeah, Mr. thanks. Taylor. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I want to echo what Mr. Cardin said. The, um, there's, a, there's a long history with Science Camp. In, in, when, in 2003, 
three, when the, override, the first override failed, there were a group of parents that got together and saved it. And so there's a part of the community that really feels attached to it. And so, and there's just what people said tonight is very true. Mm -hmm. People have great memories of this overnight science camp in which they learned new things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure not everyone had a great experience, and I'm sure there was some exclusion. I, there, there might have been some issues. That there were, I'm sure for a teacher to be required to do that is quite a mm -hmm. quite an ask. Um, so no doubt about it. Uh, but I think it needs to be talked about with the community in a very transparent way, and there needs to be kind of a, a message, a decision made by a date certain. I don't know what that date is, whether it's going to be returned or not. You know, very clearly, like, I don't know, like by October, so people aren't misled in any way. Mm -hmm. You know, and or their, their hopes are not lifted un mm -hmm. unreason un unrealistically. Because it is true. I mean, when you look at the, uh, what kids write uh, about their K through 12 experience in Arlington, lots of them put down one of the highlights as fifth grade science camp. Mm -hmm. They do. They just, that's a fact. And so um, I think, um, I know it was a lot of work for people, but that just needs to be thought through very carefully. Mm -hmm. Just one more comment. And as, as we look at our mission and vision that we're building, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the things that were learned in science camp are sort of some of the things that we're looking to, to expand and, 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 and do. So even if we can't replace science camp, we have to replace the, that social-emotional learning somehow. Mm -hmm. so. Ms. Morgan. Um, so I guess I, um, I, I, I'm not sure. So I, I have heard. I, I've heard lots of different things about science camp, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out which of those things to believe. <laughs> I have heard that there is, you know, that there is not a commitment from the district to do science camp. I've heard that we're going to look at it. Um, I've heard that some people have looked at options and there are viable ones. And I've heard that they're, that, you know, they're not and we shouldn't even consider it because of COVID. Um, so I, I just, I don't, I don't really know when people ask me about it, I, I really don't know what to tell them and I don't feel any more clear after today. I don't, I don't have any more clarity about whether or not um, there's any commitment to providing an overnight experience for students. Um, and I guess I just, I don't wanna find out, I, I don't wanna get into a situation where at some point we have to, to tell the district that they have to do it, right? I mean, because we could get to that place with if there were enough, you know, I, I just, I, but I don't, I, I just, I don't really understand any more than I did yesterday about what the intentions are. So I don't know if there's any more clarity that you can give us tonight. I mean, it sounds like we're gonna think about it. Um, I don't know, like, it, so I, I don't have any more clarity about it, so I couldn't share with others what that might be. Um, what I'm remembering from, I don't remember how long ago, two, three years, something, was there was, and, and clearly Dr. Holman wasn't here, but there was a definite sense from the administration that they were trying, that, that the feeling that I got was there was thinking about phasing it out and looking at other things and 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 it was said at least in subcommittee meetings and I don't remember I don't think it was full committee I, I don't remember um, but that's when you say people are hearing things that that's part of where you know it's not just people making things up not that they would but there were definite statements made by various members of the administration about this, and it wasn't in a, it was just statements that existed by themselves. It wasn't a, mm -hmm. here, we're gonna take a big picture look at this, mm -hmm. and how can we fix it? It was just kind of, we're kind of going this way. Um, and yeah, I think we, we need to know what the process is so that we can tell people what's coming and how the decisions are going to be made and because it is and part of it is 
we <coughs> never heard from the people who science camp was not a good thing for. And I'm not, um, I am not trying to discount their feelings or concerns. Mm -hmm. But we have to have this conversation hearing from all these voices and, and figure out, because what we have heard is all the good things. And there were a lot of good things. And we don't want this to just go away. But I do acknowledge there's other things we didn't hear that I, I know were not good things. So. And I think the sense of people is that the, the intent of the district is just to, to kill it, that there is no desire to do it, and that it just would, that the best thing to do is to sort of delay, delay, push, push, you know, um, and eventually it will just die and there won't be anybody left who remembers it. And um, that's, that all pre, that predates you, <laughs> well predates you. Um, but I do think that this is a, you know, it's, it's a situation where there, um, I think we could, you know, we could lose trust pretty quickly if it's if it's not clear um, what the what the intentions are. So I I am no more clear about what the intentions are, um, but I you know I don't I don't know how we get to that point. So, but I went on science camp twice. It was a great experience from my perspective and from and actually. You know, I have a pretty good read for, of kids. I mean, I saw kids having a good experience. Mm -hmm. so. Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, I, I think it's not a, a, a time to ask for a response from the superintendent tonight. But I appreciate the fact that, you're, that she is thinking about the problem it is directing herself toward a process with community involvement for the purposes of answering all the questions that are out there. Um, I mean, maybe she'll have some thoughts for us in a couple of weeks, maybe not, and we're not gonna be, uh, there, there's so much on the plate that I don't expect her to be thinking uh, about such a long-term thing over the course of the next two weeks, given everything else that's on her plate. But I, I feel comfortable that she is taking this seriously. Um, and as, we get out of the, the school year and have a little reflective time can bring people together and, and uh, explore the options and engage the community. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not in a position right now to say yes, absolutely, um, or no, absolutely not. I don't, I'm, we're not, I'm not in that space yet. I, I am, I've learned about the history of and the reasons why families want an experience like this over the course of this year. And I've gotten to see some of the dialogue that has happened around it even just over the last couple of weeks. Um, a couple of things I'm thinking about is, one is that I know that staffing became an increasing challenge over the last several years of the implementation of this. And that that is only, if we were to try to do something next year, that's only going to be harder next year than it was before the pandemic. And I have some ideas about ways that we can resource an, an experience like that with staff who may not be teachers, but who may interface with our students on a regular basis. Um, and I have thoughts about how we can improve some of the logistics of this by thinking through what school group or at what age mm -hmm. something like this were to happen. And I think there's some potential to do an event like this that could be organized not primarily by but in partnership with the schools. Mm -hmm. I do see it as somewhat outside the charge of the public school system um, to try to get our professionally licensed staff to organize an event like this, given what I hear its benefits are. Mm -hmm. um, however, we are a district that is committed to social emotional learning and to really rich experiences for students. Um, and I see the benefits of an experience like this towards that. I wanna make sure that whatever we were to do, it would be accessible to every single one of our kids and that there would not be financial barriers 
for access barriers. And that is what makes this a particularly tricky thing to figure out how to partner, even with an outside organization, to accomplish. Um, so, yes, we are going to look into it. Um, I can think through what a timeline would be for a decision on this and get back to the committee. One last thing on this. Just that, yeah. You know, we, I'm sorry, you should with me, call on. The, um, um, we have not heard about kids not having access to it. So this is, this is news to us. So it's like be good to get that data or some report on that or some information. Uh, when you mean access, I think we're probably using the term terminology in special education, meaning that part, mm -hmm. they might be able to physically attend or they're allowed to attend, but actually being able to engage meaningfully in the activities and having the supports through the camp um, to make that engagement and that participation meaningful has been some of the issues mm -hmm. for some of our students and other students. In the yeah, so we've never heard a report on it. We've never yeah. gotten like data or report on it that I recall in my time on this committee, but yeah, maybe we did. Think I mean, no, you it's probably very anti so it's hard to like make individual. Yeah, maybe, you, you wouldn't hear from families who most likely would come and right. So it'd be hard to make a judgment on it without some report, and that report shouldn't have student names, but it should have some something in there. That's possible to do, right? I mean, sure. We can figure out what that might. Entail. Yeah, we can talk about what that might. You can like. put something together without putting student names on it. So, it sounds like this. I, does the CIA committee want to sort of take this? I just, I only mean in a, like, in a, pop, right? Like a timeline piece, yeah. right? Because my concern is that if people want something to happen in the spring of 2023, like there's a lot of planning that has mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. on and a lot of mm -hmm. problems, I'm hearing a lot of problem solving that needs to take place. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, just thinking about how can we as a committee be kept abreast of what's happening without it being a standing agenda item on, mm -hmm. you know, on our, on our yeah. Thursday evenings. Mm -hmm. We would love um, to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. That would there be, that would be great. We uh, did some, I'm looking forward to our uh, subcommittee mm -hmm. announcements because we did do some <laughs> Some brainstorming of things oh. we wanted to think about. So I'm, I'm certainly super. We'll get there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Superintendent's report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, discussion and approval of a school committee letter to the select board regarding traffic safety concerns. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah. Uh, we came out of uh, negotiations with the traffic supervisors, uh, and one of the things they mentioned was something that's not directly out of our, uh, directly in our control at all is the traffic out there and you know we've we're, we've got a whole bunch of boston drivers and we've got some dangerous situations out there and the traffic supervisors specifically mentioned two intersections that they were concerned about um, river street at university road as well as broadway at rawson road as being <clears throat> treacherous locations for the traffic supervisors uh, so they in conversation uh, asked uh, what we could do, and I said, well, okay, what, one thing we could do is forward the information to the select board and ask them to refer it to the Transportation Advisory Committee uh, for a study. So the uh, TAC is really, really very good at this. They organize little task groups and go and, and do a thorough examination come up with a set of recommendations, report back to the select board. The other thing in writing that uh, and in the discussion is there's really a lack of school zone signages on, on River Street, Broadway, and Mass Ave in various locations. And so I tacked that on the letter as things that, uh, to, to look at. I think this is important for us to do to maintain our commitment to the safety of students as they're coming to and from school. So I move that we direct the um, chair to submit this letter to the select board, copy to TAC. Second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Slickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Yes. 
And I vote yes. We could do this by voice vote, I think. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, we could. I've, we... Only, I've only ever been in a. I know, I know. <laughs> only, so thank you. I apologize. We're all here. So. Yeah, look yeah. at this. Uh, I, see, this uh, right okay. I think this is the first time we've all been seven of us together. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so discussion and first read of a school committee presentation calendar for school year 22-23. So Dr. Holman and I um, worked together to develop this draft of presentations. Um, for the 2022-23 school year. It's, some of it is similar from the one that uh, Dr. Holman and Mr. Hainer had shared with us last summer, um, but I also added some of the items that we will still need for um, our superintendent evaluation in November. Um, and I also asked that we add more, um, we incorporated more department updates uh, for next year so that not only are we hearing from the schools, but also from from the different content areas. Um, and I've added a note from earlier about the equity audit. Um, mm -hmm. So um, feel free to, you know, look over this if there's any feedback you want to share now or you can share some other feedback with Ms. Diggins uh, at a later date, but just this is to give everybody an overview of of what we're thinking um, this morning. Just in the summer programming report, can we specify both ESY and Title I so that we get both? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's different people, right? Yep. So. Mm -hmm. Dr. Allison Ampey. So, this is really great, and I would love for us to hear of all this. I'm just wondering if it might be a little amb over ambitious, um, but I will leave it to you folks to decide. Mm -hmm. so Dr. Holm is assuming we're going to rise to her level of energy. <laughs> <laughs> so we did try. That was actually one of the conversations, and you'll see, like, we tried to. Um, refer some of these things to subcommittees too so that it wasn't <laughs> wasn't all in a full committee meeting so that's something that we can think about too if there are things that mm -hmm. um, that would be better time would be better spent in a subcommittee I will add that the draft that I have I have like a working version of this and we've added some subcommittee notes to a few of these things in particular um, more workshopping and budget subcommittee in January I think Omicron took over a bit this year in January, which was at a really critical and challenging time. Um, and at the same time that I was doing a number of reports on the entry plan. And so I want to make sure that I'm sort of uh, budgeting time in places where subcommittee heavy work needs to happen. Sounds like fall will be very busy in CIAA and I know that January will be very busy. Um, for budget, so if there are other subcommittees that we are that we can project, knowing have some heavy work to do, that would be helpful to sort of sketch in as well. No. Um, so then the other thing that I wanted to talk about was um, some dis some summer workshop retreat topics. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Ms. Diggins. Um, and all of you for responding so quickly about available dates. Um, I have some thoughts about what we might do, and then I'm interested to hear yours as well. Um, so first, I, um, I'm hoping that we could do some kind of reflection on our first year um, working together with Dr. Holman. Um, just, uh, I'll leave that there for now. Um, and then as we've been talking about the strategic plan and the strategic priorities having an opportunity in the summer to, to workshop um, that plan and giving us time as a committee to, to, to really get into some of the, the meat of the action steps, um, assuming that we're able to approve the priorities so that in the fall when that starts to get drafted and, and put together, Dr. Holman has had some feedback from all of us on where we, we would like to see it going. Um, and then the third topic is um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion workshop for us as a committee. I think that Dr. Holman and Ms. Thomas have done a tremendous amount of work with their staff, um, and your 
letter about the hiring practices. Um, I, I've just never, I hadn't seen anything so tangible about, mm -hmm. about how mm -hmm. you're thinking so much mm -hmm. about this. And so I just think it's important that we as a school mm -hmm. committee um, are participating in, in those conversations and in this work as well. So those are my thoughts and now I'm interested in, in yours. Mm -hmm. Mr. Slickman. Yeah, I mean, the DIA work really is important for us. I think it's a focus uh, that the district is working hard on and we need to be a part of that. Uh, the other thing is when we did the overarching goals uh, 10 years ago, uh, it was in many ways a work product that came out of another agenda item, which was to bring the committee together. Uh, to, develop, to build the relationships among members to get an, uh, uh, and, to, and to build a common language amongst each other so that we understood each other and could say certain things and we all understood. Um, I think that two years of COVID has sort of frayed the collegial glue of the committee because we haven't been together. Uh, we, we haven't sustain the relationships that we had uh, two, uh, two years ago. And, and I think that we need to come back together as human beings who meet in the same room together rather than little boxes on the screen and, and, and bring that back together. I, I, I've really missed that. I, I've missed the, the physical presence of being with colleagues and, and the conversations that happen beyond what can uh, happen over Zoom. Um, I, I think we need to talk about the implications of the, the override and the work that we need to do as a school committee leading up to that. I mean, there, there's a lot of, uh, and Len really blended a lot of it the last time and we, we, we supported you. Um, but, but there was a lot in, in developing, well, in developing the, the five-year budget plan and, and engaging with the community and, and presenting around that and coming. Um, I, you know, it's mm -hmm. 2023 is going to be here before we know it. And I, I think having some common understanding of, of what that's going to mm -hmm. look like and what our role as a, as a body is going to be in that, I think is, is going to be important and it's going to take multiple conversations to get to something meaningful. So. Um. I had actually, I, I agree that I would like us to do a DEI workshop. I had wondered about doing it together with the select board, just that it would give us a chance to get together with them, because we've had um, very few opportunities in the past year, two years to do that. But I don't, I don't want to take our workshop time for them. <laughs> So it would be separate. But anyway, that was just one idea I had had. Mr. Hainer. Just to add on that, when we were talking about having diversity in the, the Margaret's position and the Tom's position, they brought that idea of coming, bringing the two groups together. And we have, I'm, I'm going to brag, we have more of a commitment to do things together, I think, than they do. Um, by putting the... I think it would be good for all of us to be together, see how the other people wear the other shoes. Sherry. You know, I, I'm, I'm not giving a lot of thought to how we're going to do it. I'm glad we're going to have, so we have two days, right? Two, two three-hour sessions. That's what, that's what we've booked right now, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, you know, DEI workshop is like, you know, that goes like, that's pretty broad. I mean, you know, there's, I mean, you could, there's a lot there. So um, we, uh, so I don't know, um, I mean, I'm not opposed to it. It's just that there's, you know, you kind of usually do a series of workshops over a course of many months and, you know, you, you explore a lot of different topics. And so um, I'm not sure what, you know, maybe we could do something, but I agree with Jane <laughs> and that we need to start to have conversations now about, you know, coming together and being unified about our, about our position on the, override but clarity on on what it means I mean I think we need to kind of go into that in depth and talk about it in depth because you know 
we've had um, in the past here negotiations with the select board and other people about the number, and we've had we haven't all agreed. We haven't all agreed, and so I think it'd be good to kind of start that process so that we're all aligned. Not in the recent years, but before that, we were not all agreed. <clears throat> The consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are con considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22269, May 31st, 2022, in the amount of $725,687.70. School Committee regular meeting minutes, May 26, 2022. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Hainer, second yes. by Mr. Cardin. All in favor? Yes. yes. Fine. Yeah. I, I don't even know how it works. I, I did great. Did you want to? I think you have to do a roll call. Oh, for, for oh, a consent agenda? Because it's it's everything. No, no. That, we're, we're all here. We're, we're, we're meeting. <laughs> we, are on a, we have a remote connection. But the members are voting are here. Whatever. Okay, fine. <laughs> I'm not going to. Aye. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. All right, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Budget will be scheduling a meeting soon. Community relations, Mr. Hainer. School committee chat Saturday, this Saturday, uh, June 11th at 11 to 12 for special education families. Thank you. Curriculum, instruction, assessment, and accountability, Ms. Morgan. Uh, we had a meeting, it was great. <laughs> yeah. We talked about that meeting earlier. Uh, I guess we're going to have some more meetings. Uh, where we're going to talk about the same thing that we talked about the last meeting. We're going to meet. No, we are going to meet like on Tuesday, the 21st. We're going to talk about the mission and the vision. And then uh, that's what we're going to do this school year. We are also going to meet at some point and talk about science camp. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. Mr. Mason and I are going back and forth, and we're probably going to we'll, we'll set a meeting. I don't know if we're going to get it in by the end of June. We'll see. Right, Policy and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. It was tremendous joy. Uh, in anticipation, we're going to meet at 10:45 or some at some point like that on next Wednesday, the 15th. Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. It is going great. We're <laughs> not meeting in July. We don't think. I, I'm the, I thought I was the chair of legal services. But legal services I, I subcommittee, I'm the chair, so, Mr. Cardin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we have an update. Um, we are we are um, switching counsel um, uh, to Katie Meinold. Meinold. Um, there is. It's actually not a, a formal retention letter because I think probably because she hasn't formed the firm yet. But she's forming the firm as of July first, twenty twenty two, and this is her offer to us. Uh, so I move that the superintendent is directed to engage KM Education Law LLC as school counsel and authorized to sign a uh, retention agreement. Second. Can we Are there do any this questions as a or discussion? Sorry. Can we do? Can we uh, approve this as a as a subcommittee report? Yes. We can direct her to do it. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. because as it's, opposed to having it on the agenda as a specific right. item. Um. Because uh, I had, I so Dr. Roman had asked me to put it on yes. the agenda, and I this agenda is so full that I had asked to wait till next I see. meeting. But okay. if it's okay to do it here, I'm open to that. Can it wait till next meeting? It can. I wanted to, if, if there's going to be any discussion, concern, or otherwise, then it would be nice to know that. Um, mm -hmm. now. We can have a consensus to support. Yes. I, I see no problem supporting it, but I think for open meeting that we're retaining new counsel, that should be on the agenda. Mm -hmm. So I will put okay. that in there. Mm -hmm. I withdraw my motion. I think, yeah. I, I just wanted to clarify. So this is, we still retain Valerio? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. yes. This okay. is a replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, um, this would end our agreement with Stoneham Chandler and Miller. Um, Ms. Meinl. Ha was previously counsel with Stone Chandler Miller. We've worked with her in the past, um, and we did interviews for this process, and we spoke with multiple firms and considered multiple um, opportunities, and members of our community who interact most frequently with counsel felt that she was a great fit for what we need and what we um, have really 
enjoyed having in the council that we've had in the past. So, and just I don't I understand she's forming her firm and stuff, but what is there for backup? I mean, so she has. Why don't you speak to this a little bit? Because she has. So she's currently a part of um, the Sankey Minor Law Firm, but um, it's dissolving because uh, Attorney Sankey is retiring. So that's what um, Mr. Cardin's uh, referring to is that she'll be opening her own firm. He will stay on as counsel. So. He would, or of counsel is the term, um, and so he would be back up if necessary. Okay, okay. so there's not just one. It's not just her. I know yeah, sometimes that. we need counsel like now. <laughs> okay, checking. Mm -hmm. Okay, liaison reports? Announcement? Mr. Hainer? Uh, I want to commend students and staff of the Audison School for the Memorial Day program. This is an annual program inviting and honoring veterans. There were veterans from Korea, Vietnam, and enduring freedom. We all wanted you to know how grateful we are and want to thank the students and teachers again for remembering us and those who do not, did not come back. All right, um, we are going to- Can we do future agenda items? Oh, thank you, sorry, future agenda. <laughs> Um, just the 22-23 goals, we got it. We did a first read and then we dropped them from this meeting, so they need to they're, be on the no, 20. Yeah, they're on my meeting. list for okay. mm -hmm. Great. I'll write it again, but they are on that list. Okay. Mr. Hainer. Could I have a very brief uh, discussion, uh, school committee chat format for 22-23 school year, whether it's Zoom, continue to do it Zoom or live, or make a combination. Brief discussion, that's all. That's good. Sorry, I'm. That's all right. <laughs> I'm in three I'll remind places. you. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. So now we will enter into executive session, um, and we will not be coming back from executive session into open session, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and/or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and/or non-union, in which, if held in an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, in which, if held in an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. AEA and AAA negotiation discussions and to approve executive session meeting minutes from May 26, 2022. Motion? So move. Second. Okay. M motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Schlickman. This has to be roll call. This has to be roll call. Okay, yeah. that's it. Okay, Mr. Hainer. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Anthony. Yes. And I vote yes. It's unanimous. 